Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today, yes, we're going to Australia. Uh, this case has been in the news day after day because it's such a strange case. And it's one of those things that it's truly a mystery. She Did she do it or didn't she do it? So it's not a case of who, who are all the suspects? It's this is the suspect. But is she totally innocent? Is it just just some horrible thing that happened? And she could she looks like she could have done it so um it's gonna be a very interesting case her name is erin patterson um she is accused of serving beef wellington to her in-laws uh and killing off three of them and one has got liver damage uh and needs a new liver and the concept is that there was this death cap mushroom in the beef beef wellington so i'm going to get into the basis of the case but this is going to be a little different today because I have something that I think is very unusual. Um, I looked at this case and I came to my conclusions. And then last night I was, I was rewatching one of my, my favorite, favorite series of all time. I, I usually watch it like late at night when I want to relax. Um, and that is death in paradise. And I've, I've got all the, all the, all the seasons and I'm in season, what is it? Oh, seven. Now I've already finished all the seasons, but I'm reviewing. And I just find it peaceful. I love the little island of San Marie. I love the, the police department there. I, I, I love the detective and, and how everybody works together. And I like the fact that the murder is always really quick and not it's not a gory thing. And then it's all about solving the puzzle. So I watched this last night and I said, oh my gosh, in this particular episode, is exactly what I was talking about in my head at that point in time, about how I analyzed and came to my determination on this case. And here I'm seeing something very similar in Death in Paradise. So you can learn from certain shows on television. So we're going to get to that. But first, I want to welcome people who are in the chat room. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I've already said hello to a lot of people, but if you just showed up, uh, I think Beverly just showed up and Stephanie and I think you're the last two to show up and I said hello to everyone else. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, people in Australia and New Zealand should be awake. Um, people in the UK uh, <laughs> should be asleep. Uh, and the rest of the US people should manage in there somewhere. So I'm, I'm glad you're all here. And uh, oh, oh, Stephanie, you got, <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. You've returned. You had COVID, Ooh. but you're better now. That's good news. All right. And uh, let's see, Lex is here too now. And let's, uh, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna go through it all again, but if you'd like to be in the chat room, please let me do my important thing to keep this channel going. Um, please do look at the link below and join Patreon, it's five bucks a month. You come to eight different live shows. And if you come to the live shows, you can participate in the chat room. You also can be in our community and you don't have to see any advertising if you haven't paid the extra money to not watch YouTube with advertising. So it has a lot of advantages and it helps this educational channel. Uh, of course, you don't have to join Patreon. Please do subscribe, like the like the videos, um, share, and check the playlists because all my playlists have all these tons of cases on them. So look through everything, find the cases you're interested in. You can also support the channel, find books below or clicking on the little dollar sign. All right, that's it. Okay, let's get to this case. Because I do find this a really, really interesting case. All right. Kathy is here too. Okay. Ready? <laughs> okay. Here we go. It's for you who've never heard of this case yet. And it's, it's, it's like really recent, like last week or something. Um, so anyway, this is Erin Patterson. Uh, she cooked and served a meal that is believed to have killed three people and left another fighting for his life. All right. And let me let me show you just a little picture of the, our victims here. Um, where do our victims go? Yeah, there. There they are. These are the four people. Um, these uh, these two here. Let me see if I get these people straight here. So, uh, okay, where is it? Come on now. Don't do this to me. I thought it was. Oh, here we go. All right. Now. She has an ex, all right? She has an ex who is not living with her. She's living with her two teenage daughters. That she, I'm sorry, two, two teenage children. I think one, one is a boy and one is a girl. And um, her husband, ex, 
lives not in the exact same town, but nearby. And then I might be getting this wrong. <laughs> I forgot where everybody lived. Anyway, these two are her ex's parents. Those are her in-laws. They both died. They were invited to this lunch where she served beef Wellington and they died. Also, this lovely lady died. That was, I think that's one of their sisters. And that is her husband, who's a pastor. He's the only one that's alive and needs a liver transplant. He's very, very ill and critical, and but he needs a liver transplant. So three out of four died who ate the meal that she served, which was beef wellington. She, on the other hand, did not die. Interesting. Um, and her children who ate the leftovers the next day also did not die. And I'll get into the explanation that she gives for all of this. Um, so, and some of you might have seen uh, on television, uh, they've shown these uh, different shows. Uh, 60 Minutes Australia, I have a link below. Uh, watch that for more information on the case. Uh, but this, it's been all of the news like this. Three dead after being served a family lunch. And here we have the, the reporters are all over her. Now she's gotten out of her car at her home and she's crying and she's trying or she's fake crying. I can't tell which one it is from a distance, but she's like, I love these people. Stop bothering me. And, and being the media, they're harassing the living crap out of her. So, which I've never been fond of. So that's the way it goes sometimes. But anyway, uh, so these are her, these are the people she invited for lunch. Uh, and she invited them to her home here. OK, now I want to point out something just before we go on a little further. Um, let's see if I can find that picture here. Uh, where'd he go? <laughs> I've lost her husband. Um, he vanished on me. Um, she when you when we, one looks at motive, like why would she want to kill her, her in-laws? And her, her ex was supposed to show up, but he, he, at the last minute he ducked out. Why would she do this? And some would say, well, you know, insurance money or something. First of all, I think they were officially divorced, although it's a little confusing. She's she's rich as crap. I just want to point that out before we go further. Her mother died and left her so much money. She had like huge homes and she is not poor. <laughs> this woman has a lot of money. OK, she doesn't need anybody's money. So that is not going to be a motive. So then what would the motive be for her doing something like this? And that's important because she thinks she's saying she has no motive. She she loves her, her, her ex-in-laws and she thinks they're great people and She's like, Phew. so, and I don't think at this point they figured out what motive there could be. So let's keep that in mind. All right. So now here she is at this house and she's going to serve these people some beef Wellington. All right. Now, um, let me read you a little more of the story. All right. So, so she, the former in-laws uh, caused their death. Gail Patterson, 70, husband, Don. Um, who is uh, 70 as well, Gail's sister, Heather Wilkin Wil Wilkinson, 66. All three were taken to the hospital with symptoms of food poisoning the day after they ate the meal at the Patterson home in the small town of Leongatha uh, in the southern state of Victoria. This happened on July 29th. All three died a few days later. Heather Wilkinson's husband, Ian, that's this guy here, 66, was also at the meal and is still in the hospital in critical but stable condition. Uh, and he's waiting for that liver transplant. All right. Now, she served them beef wellington, which everyone ate. Now, what does she say about this? She says, they said here that um, she said she brought the, bought the mushrooms at a major supermarket. Let's look at the mushrooms. All right. Oops, that's not the mushrooms. Where my mushrooms go? There they are. <laughs> she bought these mushrooms to make this. Uh, oh, wait, before some of you are going, what the heck is Beef Wellington? <laughs> okay, let's stop and take a look at Beef Wellington. It's really a very fancy, fancy dish. Um, I've never eaten it. Um, I looked up the recipe. And by the way, I've linked below a video of how to make this Beef Wellington by a top guy. And he said, oh, you just do this, this, and this is so easy. And then he went on and on and on with all these different steps. And it looked very difficult to me. But you need to understand how it's made. So I'm just going to give you a, a quick rundown on how it is made. So what you do is you get some beef. You sear it. All right. And then you brush the beef with mustard. Or I'm sure somebody else has different slight recipes. But anyway, you, you brush it with mustard after it cools. 
Then you prepare the mushrooms. You see those mushed up mushrooms? You chop up the mushrooms, you put them in a food processor and pulse them, pulse until they're finely chopped. Then you saute them, you wanna get the moisture out. And then when you get them pretty much all the moisture out of them, you leave them to dry and cool. All right, after that, you wrap the beef. You, oh, wait a minute, you roll out a piece of plastic. You lay out slices of ham. Um, so they overlap. And then you spread all the mushroom mixture over the ham. Then you put the beef in the middle and you roll the sucker up. After you do that, it's not tightly rolled and you get it all together, you refrigerate it. And then you roll out puff pastry, this pretty stuff here. You see the puff pastry? You roll that out and then you roll the beef in it. And this is a fancy lattice you can put on there. And the guy in the video, I'll show you how to, that's a, he put a fancy lattice on it and it's just gorgeous. And then you put the egg yolk over it and you bake the sucker. All right. <sighs> That's uh, to me quite a process, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm curious. Is anybody here who here has had beef Wellington? Anybody? Oh, you. Oh, really? Charlotte says I never thought of beef Wellington as fancy. Maybe it's just more popular here in England. It may be, but it still seems like a lot of work, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's still you got to do the you got to do the mushroom thing. You got to do the rolling thing. You got to put the puff pastry on. I guess maybe it's not that hard if you just know how to do it. Yeah, you know, you might be right. One day I'm going to have to make it just because I'm curious now. <laughs> oh, sounds like a celebration dinner. Well, Charlotte's saying it's not, but this is interesting because she's invited these people over to the house for lunch and she's not married to the her ex anymore. And some it said that she might have been trying to get them over so she could coax them into encouraging him to come back to her, which... Might be true she had, hadn't actually poisoned them. So if she's innocent, that might be a reasonable thing. She was just trying to say, oh, why don't you, you know, step in there for me and say we should have our family together again because, you know, I love all you guys. But if she poisoned them, I don't think that would have been the motive. <laughs> she wouldn't be trying to get together if she's going to kill his parents and him if he were there. So, yeah. Um, well, she just invited the closest people in her life. We, I don't really know how many close people she has in her life. I don't. So, um, let's see, um, let's see if anybody else has had beef Wellington, <laughs> who's had beef Wellington and lived to talk about it. Well, I know this sometime in the near future, I'm going to make beef Wellington and I'll, I'm going to call up my friends and see if any, will, any of them will come over or they're going to go, I don't know about that. You know, I saw your show. <laughs> It could be interesting. Oh, you're, you say it is fancy. I think it looks fancy. I think it looks fancy. It's a fancy. That's a good point. It's a fancy beef pie. Yeah, I'll go with that one. Oh, you said red carpet dish. Fancy, fancy. Okay. I think it looks fancy. I think it looks like it takes time to make. All right. So now. <laughs> so anyway. All right. So, okay. Now she's made this dish. She's fed everybody. Now listen to some of the other things she says. All right. She said she bought the mushrooms. Oh, let's go back to those mushrooms. All right. Let's go back to the mushrooms. Uh, where's the mushrooms? Um, the mushrooms, she said she made out of two things. And I had to look into this. One was these button mushrooms you can buy at any grocery, right? And then she said she also had used some dried Chinese mushrooms that she had bought three months prior in Melbourne. Now, this is going to play a big part in uh, this whole story here. But, and I looked up, like, why would you put Chinese mushrooms in beef Wellington? And it's not the most popular choice, but there are some people, there's a, there's a mix, I guess there's a, there's a divided thing here. But one group says you don't do that because it, they don't rehydrate well and they get too chewy. It's not a good thing for beef Wellington. Other people say they've used dried mushrooms and found it successful. Nobody actually said Chinese dried mushrooms, but there you go. And she says she bought them three months prior in Melbourne. So some reason she's over there uh, and picked these up at the grocery store. I don't know whether she, there's no uh, China, uh, Asian grocery stores in her neighborhood, in the location where she lives. So I'm not quite sure she picked them up there um, or claims to, but, uh, I mean, it's possible you're just, you know, you're, just, you're I, I mean, I've done this myself. You go out for like a, if there's like a, 
you know, Chinese neighborhood of town. You just go to, you know, some really good Chinese food. Uh, and then you go, oh, look, it's a grocery store. And you roll in and you pick up some things. I do, I have bought dried mushrooms before. So I'm not saying it's, it's impossible for her to have done that. But I'll get to one of the reasons this is interesting. All right. So that's, these are the two things she said she used. And by the way, this is a food dehydrator she owned. Not that one exactly, but one like it. And we'll get to that dehydrator issue in a minute. So she said she bought the mushrooms at a major supermarket chain and in an Asian grocery store in Melbourne, a large city, a large city near. Oh, OK. Leon Gotha. I didn't look up the map. OK, so it's not that far from there. So she might have that might have been the closest place you could pick up something like that. She also said that she ate the meal herself and that it landed her in hospital with bad stomach pains and diarrhea. But police said last week that she did not present with any symptoms. OK, so I'll get to this in a minute. I just want to give her story first. She claims she ate the meal with everybody else. Um, and I, well, I do want to point out that at this point in time, if, if, if the last survivor isn't conscious and doesn't become conscious or remember much, she can't actually prove she ate the meal with everybody, can she? Because they're all dead. But one would think if everybody sat down to the meal and had the whole meal, because they, they ate the meal and then they went home and didn't get sick till the next day, as happens with death cap mushrooms. So she theoretically, it would be strange if she didn't have dinner with everybody else. She claims she ate dinner with everyone else. So keep this in mind. Um, and she said, I'm now devastated to think that these mushrooms may have contributed to the illness suffered by my loved ones. She means these mushrooms, by the way, that somehow poisonous death cap mushrooms ended up in Asian mushroom store in a package that they were actually packaged somewhere maybe in China or Taiwan where I don't know if they have death cap mushrooms there, but that's what supposedly was in there. All right. And she says, I really want to repeat that. I have absolutely no reason to hurt the, these people whom I loved. Then they said, um, let's see what happened after this. Uh, she said, uh, police have said all four of uh, Patterson's guests showed symptoms consistent with poisoning of death cap mushrooms for a particularly deadly variety, although the official cause of death has not been confirmed. All right. They searched her home and so on and so forth. They're trying to keep an open mind. They have not said that she is a suspect. Oh, no. They say, well, no charges have been brought. She is a suspect. Okay. She has to be. They, they either died in spite of her or they died because of her. So, and she says, this is something else she says. In her statement, Patterson said she prepared a meal of beef wellington for herself and her guests. She, she said she served the meal and allowed the guests to choose their own plates and then took the last plate and ate a serving herself. Okay, so let's go back to this. All right, so Essentially, she's saying she's, you know, you have this beautiful beef wellington and she's saying she cut it up like this and she put them all on separate plates. I don't know if she put them on a counter, you know, on an island and then everybody came and got their food and sat down at the table. So she didn't she didn't cut it and serve each one of them. She let them take she put them all on plates. They each took whatever plate they wanted and she took the last plate. OK, this is very similar to. um same thing if you let's say you put out uh, uh, some uh, some wine glasses and you opened up a, a bottle of wine and you poured all the wine in the wine glasses and people took what they wanted and you took the last one let's say you poison them one let's say poison one glass how would you know that that person was going to get that glass how would you know you wouldn't get that glass so that's that's very very important so i i wanted to point that one out now Hold on a second. I see something missing again. Why are things missing for me? <laughs> Hold on a second. I just have to, I have to fix something. I've screwed up again. Um, where's my picture? No, my picture is missing. I'm so annoyed. How is this happening? Well, I can try to get this picture back. Uh, 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 every once in a while, as I pointed out that sometimes what happens is photos don't, don't come in. Um, uh, Oops, there, there's her husband. I wanted to show that one, but that's not the picture I'm trying to bring over. Hold on, I have some patience a second because I 
I planned this picture specifically for this particular case. And now I've got to find it and try to send it back over again, see if it shows up at some point. Uh, Verizon, my, my, my internet went, went wonky last uh, hangout, blacked out three times. And the, right after the hangout, the entire show, the whole, entire internet went down and they had to come out and they were doing 15 hours it was down. They had to come out and fix everything. And I still don't know if they've done the proper job. So, <laughs> because things aren't showing up where they're supposed to show up. So annoying. So anyway, that's her husband or her ex-husband who luckily didn't go and eat food at the house. So she says she, she cut this beautiful thing up and, 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 and lied it on the plate and all that and um, made it lovely. All right. And so they all picked their own things and she just picked one of them. And then we have to look at this theoretically, once they all picked their pieces that were cut out of that loaf, they all sat down and ate it. And all four of them got deathly ill. Three of them died. And she claims she had some stomach pains and she went to the hospital. But I mean, anybody can say they have stomach pains and diarrhea and not have stomach pains and diarrhea. That can just be something you can fake easily because you say, oh, I'm feeling really weak. I don't know. They give you some, they give you some IV stuff. Maybe they give you some, um, what is it, modium kind of stuff to stop diarrhea that you don't even have. It, it, you can say anything. They don't necessarily see it. I mean, until you're very, very ill. So she could have made up that crap. So just saying she could have. Um, th that's exactly right. Who would actually know that? But I'm going to say, it, I think she did. I'm going to say, I think she actually did that. And I'm going to explain to you why later I think she said she did that. I think it's, it's it's part of the I think the part of the clue of this thing that death in paradise is going to help you understand later. This one was this one episode is going to help show how it would work. I believe she did slice it up, put them on separate plates and everybody picked their own. I believe that's true. But let's see how this is. So. All right. So let's go on a little bit further. What else happened? All right. The two. OK, she says them. OK, um, this is the next weird thing. All right, so listen to this. Patterson also said in her, uh, oh, wait a minute. Okay, the children didn't get sick, but she said her, she served her children the next day, the leftovers, and they don't like mushrooms, so she scraped all the mushrooms off and served them with that, with that without the mushrooms. I'm going to say that's a little sketchy because, first of all, if there's poison mushrooms in there, they might have leached into something else. And would you really want to serve your beloved children something you know is poisoned if it were poisoned? But she's claiming, hey, you know, if I if they were if it was poisoned, I didn't know, but that's why my kids didn't get sick. Again, keep this in mind. That's really suspicious. Um, and I also I'm, I'm curious of how good beef Wellington would be the next day when the the pastry is soggy and the mushrooms are gone. Basically. You're just serving on a piece of meat, you know? Really? I don't buy it. So anyway, that's her statement on that. Now she goes to the hospital and she said that um, she also admitted in a statement that she lied. She told the investigators, remember that, that dehydrator thing? Well, her husband, this is, this is the claim, which is another strange claim. All right. The dehydrator issue. Supposedly, she said... She had told the investigators she had dumped her food dehydrator at a local dump a long time ago. But that's not true because the police found the food dehydrator. Why did she say she dumped it? Then she claimed this. She said she was at the hospital with her children discussing the food hydrator when her ex-husband asked, is that what you used to poison them? She panicked and she dumped the dehydrator at the dump. Okay, first thing I don't understand. Why would you be discussing the food dehydrator with your children at the hospital? You didn't use a dehydrator. I mean, generally speaking, a dehydrator, I have one. Um, it's in a cabinet. And usually you put your dehydrator, well, unless you, unless you dehydrate a lot of crap, um, it, it, 
it doesn't usually sit on the counter because it takes up a lot of space. So you put it away someplace. And when you want to dehydrate, now mine, I have a, a an actual plug inside the cabinet. I dehydrate in the cabinet because it makes a lot of noise. And so I just keep it in there. But you can, that, a lot of people take it out and then dehydrate and then put it away. I don't know if she had it on her counter or not. I would like to know. But why the heck is she talking about a food dehydrator that she did not use for this, for this, um, for this lunch. Why would you bring that up? Why, why is that a topic at the hospital? And then her husband says, after they, she's talking about the food dehydrator, husband says, well, is that what you did to kill them? You dehydrated poisonous mushrooms, which is interesting. He would say that, you know, why would he say that? Well, could it be that his ex is a mushroom forager? Could it be that the, those particular, um, those particular mushrooms, something else that didn't come over here. Hold on a second. Let me find my mush, other mushroom. Gosh, I don't know what happened here. A whole bunch of stuff just never came over. That's so annoying. <laughs> I can't tell you how that upsets me. Oh, yeah, that's really weird. Um, yes, I have missed, I have a lot of missing stuff here because things didn't want to show up. Oops. <laughs> And I didn't check it before the show. I didn't miss, notice it was missing. That is an area in which there are actual death cap mushrooms in that area near her home. And she is a mushroom forager. So I'm going to guess she has dried mushrooms before, which is why this would be something anybody would bring up. Or maybe she feels she has to defend herself against that. She had done this kind of thing before. Right? So, so now she now she told the police this, but then she says, then she says, oh, um, I, I panicked. I really didn't get rid of it three months ago. I panicked when my husband's ex-husband said that at the hospital. I panicked and picked up that food dehydrator and chucked it at the dump. Okay. And the police found it. Now they haven't, they haven't said yet. They have not said yet whether they've actually found uh, any kind of, um, evidence in that food dehydrator of the mushrooms. Now, whether uh, the question of whether she, hold on a second, I'm trying to send this over. The important thing that's not coming over because something's wrong with the internet, I'm sending, I'm sending it over a different way to me. Just little patience, please. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so annoying. And I can't tell you why these things don't work sometimes. And I've never figured out where the actual problem is besides me. So... <laughs> Okay, I'm going to send that one over because I want to show you this one. This is important. Um, uh, this is true. You don't need a good memory if you're telling the truth. Yes, that is true. I <laughs> I don't know anyone with a dehydrator except Pat. Yeah, well, I used to. I, I haven't dehydrated that much, but um, I have done some raw food stuff. So I have the most amazing onion onion. It's like an onion bread, but it's just mostly onions and uh, what else is in there? Um, what are those little seeds? <laughs> um, delicious. Absolutely delicious. So you wash your, you wash my, I wash my food dehydrated when I'm done using it. A lot of it depends on the, yeah. Yeah. Usually you take out the, the, that section and you wash it off. So one would assume she had done that. And here's the thing that a lot of people say, well, if she hadn't used this for poisonous uh, mushroom dehydrating, why bother to get rid of it? Because when the police took it, all they'd find is nothing, right? Absolutely nothing. So I think that that is, uh, to me, very interesting. So the claims she has are, are really questionable. So, um, uh oh, do you still see me? Because I'm, I'm mucking around here trying to find my picture. That's really annoying me. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, there's my picture. I found my picture at least. <laughs> I just hope I, I don't know if you're still seeing me because I can't see myself. Let's see. Where are, where are we? Oh, there. Did, did I disappear or I'm still here? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm mucking around here trying to get my picture. Because this is, this is, this was my whole point of my story here. And I can't believe I, that one, that picture didn't make it over. So I'm, I'm pulling it down now. Aha. Now I've got it. Oh, shoot. I don't want to save. Okay. I do want to save the background, but. Help. How do I do that? Okay. I'm not going to do it yet. I <laughs> see juice. <laughs> what? 
Okay. I'm going to bring that in later. <laughs> it's eight o'clock at night here. I must be tired or something. A oh, long day at the soccer field watching my granddaughter. Okay. So now let's take a look at what she says. All right. What we have here is the question is a number of things. Is it, is it an accidental death by somehow, somehow poisonous mushrooms got in here to, without her knowing it? and ended up in, in, in the beef wellington. That's one possibility. Two, a mass murderer from China put death cap mushrooms in here and wanted, you know, like, the, remember the, um, was it the Tylenol guy, you know, put, you know, poison in the Tylenol bottles? Could he be that guy who wanted to see, hey, some Americans or wherever those things go in the world, because I'm sure they, he wouldn't know if they were going to America or they're going to Singapore <laughs> or to England. Somebody somewhere is suddenly going to die of death cap poisoning and they're going to say, oh, I got it from this. And they, that guy would be super excited at the factory. And do you think it could be a mass murderer? Does anybody go with the, the Chinese mass murderer? <laughs> no way accident. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm trying to see here. Uh, oh, no. Well, okay. Pointing out this from Walty Matilda. Did any of Patterson's house pets mysteriously die? I don't know if she had any. Sometimes a poisoner will dry, do a dry run on their pet. Not that I know of. However, a year prior, her husband got deathly ill after a lunch he had from her. And apparently went, in, went to the hospital, I think, 16 days in a coma. <laughs> they never quite figured out what happened to him. Just keep that in mind. All right. So... All right, so, well, no, well yeah, why would she get rid of this if this were the mushrooms she used? Exactly. Why would you worry about the dehydrator if these were the mushrooms? All right, very good. Now, let's look at the mass murder theory first so we can get rid of it really quick. Okay, you see how, do you see the amount of mushrooms in her? Now, first of all, if it's a mass murderer, would he have just managed to get poisonous mushrooms in this one bag and nobody else anywhere in the world died of death cap poisoning. Just, just these people, just from this one bag. The next thing, I want to know, did she use, this is something I, I don't see, I haven't seen them ask. Did she use every one of these mushrooms? In other words, she bought these three months ago. Was she planning to use it? Because sometimes I've used, um, you know, you'll use like, 10 mushrooms to add to something. You don't necessarily use an entire bag of those mushrooms. And I don't know how big the bag was, mind you. But you get something. This is a me medium-sized bag, but you can get massive big bags. I don't know if they come smaller. But, you know, usually you take some out. You might take out 10, 15, and chop them up. That's a lot. Now, could she use a lot like this for this particular dish? Yes, she could. So if I were the in investigator, I'd be, I'd be, well, she doesn't have the bag anymore either. She just made the suckers. I mean, I guess they just went straight into the trash and the trash went away. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't have any leftovers and the bag disappeared. But I find it interesting that in three months, she never used them. She never used part of the bag, but she used all of them at this one moment in time. Is it possible? Yes, but I would like to question. Um, <laughs> women use poison to kill. Uh, that's one of their major main ways because they have control of kitchens and it's it's a soft method. It doesn't require physical strength. Um, you're, you say no on the Chinese mass murder. <laughs> um, <laughs> your story is more complicated than actually making beef Wellington. <laughs> so true. <laughs> all right, let's see. All right. You find too many coincidences. The whole story of her going against all odds and not being affected at all is already too many coincidences, and that is being generous. All right. So well, let's go to let's go to death and paradise. Okay. I want to show you why I wanted to talk about death and paradise. Oh, by the way, I I, I worked hard on this. Um, <laughs> this is this is the this is the the recipe that's in, in the video, it's below, so you can find out how to do it. And that the mushroom stuff is called Duxel. Duxel. I looked this up specifically so I wouldn't botch it because apparently a lot of people say duck cells or duck cell. Um, it's, but it's a, originally a French pronunciation, so it's Duxel. Duxel. I just want to do that. <laughs> okay. Now, 
how does death in paradise help us understand this? Now, I'm, I'm saying I, I'm not lying. I, I already came to my conclusions before I saw the show. But then when I saw this show, I saw how similar it was. OK, so I think it's just cool. All right. So th this came from this this move, this this episode called The Stakes Are High. Four poker players compete for three million dollars and one of them is murdered. Now, before I go on, I want to point this out. This one of her friends said this. Uh, Leon Gatha mushroom cook Aaron Patterson once bragged to friends about being good at details and loved crime fiction. Hmm. So she's and one of the things she said was that, which I thought was actually very clever. <laughs> Apparently, when she was married, she hated cleaning and her husband wouldn't help. And so behind his back, she hired she hired some cleaners to come in and clean the house while he wasn't there. And he'd get home and the house was great and she would take credit for it. <laughs> Wish I'd thought of that when I was married. Dang it all. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty brilliant when you come right down to it. But devious and a liar. OK, isn't that clever? <laughs> I kind of like it, but it shows you that she is kind of clever and she likes true crime and mysteries and she's into detail. So you see, there's a lot of things here which make me look at her. All right. So now let's go to um, I'll check your comments on it, see if anybody else is. Uh, um, <laughs> is it going to make her chef in prison? Maybe not. <laughs> you think you think she's a whack job? OK. Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, what about the members of the general public who might also have bought contaminated mushrooms? Apparently, the dried mushroom sales have dropped because people are panicked. Uh, Patterson wants us to believe that the bag she purchased was contaminated. Only that bag. Oh, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I've never seen that packaging for the supposed dehydrated Chinese mushrooms which was covered either. I haven't seen that. Um, uh, and she also said it was um, some type of bag that was handwritten or something. It didn't have proper stamping on it. So I don't know. It's interesting. Um, oh, I, OK. Glad you brought this up because this is going to be part of the mystery. I read that Patterson supplied the hospital with the beef Wellington leftovers. Why dispose of the dehydrator and then do that? Um, well, no, that makes sense. The beef Wellington had the poisonous mushrooms in it, but the dehydrator should not because this is where the poisonous mushrooms came from, not here. So she, she's giving them the beef Wellington to say, Hey, I'm willing to cooperate. I didn't hear what they said about whether they found the poison, of the beef Wellington or not, whatever was left over. I guess it was, a, I don't, did they not eat very much of the beef Wellington? I don't know. Um, Let's see. Um, because she didn't poison the whole dish. Interesting thought, Sarah, but no. Because think about it. it that would be extremely difficult to do. And then she, she's going to take the leftover piece. And then she'd have to be lucky to get the leftover piece. So, it, you know, you don't know how much things, you know, when it's in, it's cooking in the, and the, uh, the juices are going through, how much that transmits and everything. So I would find that would be very risky for her to take, to do that so all right residual flow yeah okay now let me go to let me go to the story now in this story let me tell, give you the story basically four porker pork players <laughs> they weren't porkers they were poker players <laughs> i wasn't there no uh, four four poker players going for three million dollars on the lovely on the saint marie they're playing the game and I, when they play the game, one of the guys takes his hand and they're betting. And he's like about to bet. And he does he does not raise, raise or he doesn't go raise. And so he's just going to, um, yeah, he doesn't raise. That's the most important thing. He doesn't raise. Keep this in mind. And then they show, they show their hands, but he croaks before that. And they look at his hand. His hand had two aces in it. So he would have won that hand. And then they determined that the ace, the ace of spades here, had the poison on it that killed him. All right. But the question was what? The question is this. 
but only one of you was dealt the fatal ace of spades. So in other words, if there's poison on one thing and the person's dealing them out, how do they know he's going to get the ace of spades? How would they know that? How would they manage that? So that only he would touch the ace of spades. Anybody got a clue on that? <laughs> um, uh, to the answer to answer this one, no. Even if she cut it and put it on the plates, that there was the mushrooms were already in that whole duxel, duxel. It's inside the whole thing. Um, yes, yes, Sarah. It was magic. You're actually correct. Okay, deal from the bottom. This is true, but we're talking about in, in this particular sense. Um, theoretically, that could have happened, uh, but then you know it was there was a video camera seeing everything being dealt, so it was not dealt from the bottom. But but a good point. That would be you know, card people. Um, <laughs> I I actually pretty good with the cards on that too. So okay, um, but no. So then let's go to what the next thing he says. Uh, the dealer had gloves. That's true, but it didn't matter because it's just one person who got the ace of spades that darked. Trying to kill them all or trying not to. No, one guy, the one guy was targeted. All right. Now, let me go on a little further and you'll start seeing how this makes sense. All right. So let's see. Where were we here? Okay. So, okay. So, we're, or, 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 so one of you was dealt the fatal ace of spades. And then he says... So the question that was puzzling me right from the outset, how did the killer get the poison card into Bobby's hand? Okay. And then the other question was, why didn't he raise when he had two, the two, the two aces and supposedly he was the one who would win the hand. Why didn't he raise when he had good cards? And let me see if it says it here. Okay. No. So the whole thing they finally figured out was he never had two aces. He only had one ace. And when he collapsed, somebody took the crappy card he had, like a two of hearts, and replaced it with the ace of spades. When nobody was looking and it's all a sleight of hand thing after he keeled over. It looked like he had been dealt the two aces, but he hadn't. He'd only been dealt one ace and a two of whatever or whatever it was. And they had slipped the other card. They had exchanged it so that now the poison card was on the table. They actually poisoned him through a cigar that he that he had had er, slightly earlier and the poison was making its way through his system. So when he was playing at some point, he was going to fall over and then they just were going to replace the card. So they'd have a poison card on the table. A sleight of hand magic trick. Okay. And just, just as a curious aside here, they also said, and who on earth would be able to get their hands on an obscure poison derived solely from a rainforest frog or perhaps from a death cap mushroom? Who could do that? Well, we know who could do it. It could be Erin because she lived right near there and she was already a mushroom forager. So we know she has access. We know she has ability. We know she has a dehydrator that if she got these things, she could have dehydrated them quite a while back or whenever she de actually decided to dehydrate them and put them in a bag and maybe even wash this whole thing out or unless she just did it right before this whole thing and she's an idiot, but, and then chop them up and put them in, in the, uh, in the beef Wellington. But how did she not get sick from the beef Wellington? Does anybody have an idea Can, what, with a with a little scenario that comes from Death in Paradise? Move the plates around. Well, no, the, the poison was in the beef Wellington. I mean, it was in the Duke cell, you know, it was in the Duke cell. So let's look back at our beef Wellington. Uh, there's a beef Wellington. Here we are. That's the Duke cell. It's all around in there. She's going to slice it up. It's going to be there. So how is she not going to get poisoned? She did eat some. She took one plate, sat down at the table, and I believe she did this. She did. She took a plate, sat down at the table, and ate with them. How come she didn't get sick? Pretending to eat. Well, again, the people all were with her. So 
I mean, it's true. Nobody is alive to say she didn't actually finish eating the food. But I think it's it's a little bit, ah, <laughs> who just said that? There we go. That's, okay, hold on. I'm going to bring down my picture that I, that I screwed up bringing down before. Ah, CJ. That's my theory. And I'm not saying it's accurate, but that's my theory. And CJ just came up with it. All right. She made two Wellingtons. Now, the reason I think this would be clever and why she might do is because, first of all, she, generally speaking, is clever and likes crime stuff. And she's tricky little, she's a tricky little devil, right? If she makes these beef Wellingtons, all she has to do is have an extra plate with the healthy, perfectly, perfectly good beef Wellington on it. And as she gets everybody to the table, she just has to switch the plates out, just like those cards. They switch the cards out. All she had to do is switch out one, one plate of beef Wellington from the perfectly healthy beef Wellington, sit down, eat it right in front of everybody. And if she's eating the beef Wellington in front of everybody, would you question having your beef Wellington? No, you would not. Because she, it looked like she got her beef Wellington from the same loaf. It's a loaf. So it's, it's like, how would you question that? I, I, I think that's, that's what would make sense. Um, well, she moved, it's not moving, well, yes, but not the plates that she had out there. She put out five plates, one for each of them. She's not moving those plates around. She's removing one of the plates and replacing one of the plates, essentially. But she's not doing that till, take your stuff, get your get your plate, get, oh, sit down at the table, da, da, da. And the fourth person turns their back. She grabs her plate. Nobody's going to pay attention as she turns around, leans for something like a fork, and just does this and then comes up with her plate and sits at the table. Nobody's going to question. And therefore, again, she can sit in front of everybody and eat and she can even start eating in front of them. So they have no suspicion whatsoever because you would think after she may theoretically might have tried to kill her husband a year ago, they wouldn't want to show up for lunch, but she's eating right in front of them. She's eating the same thing they are. Only she's not. Only she's not. So, um, no, 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 Lex. Uh, that you that you you can't be that careful. You're not gonna you're not gonna make you cannot be that sure. You can try to say it's going to be in this part of the the thing, and I'm only. Uh, that's very difficult to do. And if she, if, she, if that's true, she would be taking a hell of a chance. So I don't think she would be stupid enough to do that. So and you can't be sure where the poison is going to end up exactly. So let's say you put it in half a loaf and cut the pieces and then try to cut a piece from the end for yourself. I guess you could do that. I'm going with two loaves. I mean, if I were doing it and I, if this was important enough for me, I'm going to make it two loaves. I can always, maybe those, that, that, those, um, the extras her kids ate that were actually maybe an actual loaf. Maybe it's from the other loaf that she made. Nobody's going to know that she made two. If you're making one, you might as well make two. So you don't have to take the chance and, oh, my God, what happens if they, they grab the one I wanted and all this stuff? No, you can lay it all out there, just beautiful as all get out, all the same size, not looking like you got a little little piece off the end like this. Because, you know, it's it's the end is probably, you know, it's more like rounded. It's like a loaf of French bread. You know, the end is, you know, um, if you're going to cut the same pieces, you're going to cut from the middle and then you're going to put the pieces out. And they're all going to be from pretty much the same part of the loaf. There's no way in God's earth you're going to make sure that the poison, you're talking about death cap poisoning. <laughs> you know, I would not touch that damn loaf if there was death cap in there. And no way I'm getting near it. So there had to be a second loaf if she's guilty. I'll, I'll swear there's going to be a second loaf. Um, <laughs> that must be the most Sherlock Holmes solution you've ever covered. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was, it was it was interesting when I was thinking about it. I'm like, the, how did she, when when she said she had them on separate plates, that's what got me. Because if she sat down with that loaf on the table, she can't get away with that, can she? She's going to be sitting at the table, like, you know, you, you bring out your Thanksgiving turkey, right? And the Thanksgiving turkey, you're going to cut that thing and hand it to people and they see you sitting there. You can't put that loaf of beef wellington in front of you, cut it a slice and give it to somebody and cut another slice and give it to somebody. And you're at the table with a whole loaf in front of you. And you cut a slice, you got to give it to yourself. You can't do that. 
But if you put it on different plates, on a counter or the island, I don't know if she's got in her kitchen, that is the way you get away with it because all you have to do is pick up the last plate and just exchange it out outside of their view. And you could do that in so many ways. You could be carrying that whole plate around the damn kitchen. Oh, oh, I forgot. I have, well, let, me, let, me, let me get the salt. And you have that plate in your hand and you come over toward your refrigerator and just dump that thing and pick up the other one. You can do all kinds of ways of just replacing the plate with nobody even having a clue. So, but I would, there's no way she ate out of that same loaf. Absolutely none. Um, they supposedly, the in-laws weren't that keen on her. <laughs> and maybe, that may be her motive. Maybe she was trying to get her husband back and they didn't want her to and she pissed her off. Um, he was supposed to come to the dinner. So that would mean to me that she was going to kill him along with the rest of them. Unless she was going to give him the second piece of the good loaf. <laughs> and then, then everybody died. But the two of them, that would have been really good. Yeah. And he would say, I was, I didn't get sick, which is that's suspicious. And he'd be looking guilty too. <laughs> I, I don't know that I'm brilliant, but it's interesting that you see the, the card thing in uh, a death in paradise. See, it's that same thing where you think things are what we see, but the, but sleight of hand magic trick, is oftentimes what does happen in these kind of cases where somebody's trying, you know, trying to be cleverer. Although that whole food food uh, dehydrated thing was idiotic, because um, they don't figure out all the details. It's a, it's a lot of work, you know. When you're actually going to commit a massive crime, it's a lot of work, and oftentimes, you, you know, you think of all the different details. As she said, she's good at them, but you miss one or two, and. Um, but if, if she did at least wash that de dehydrator out well enough and they can't come up with anything in it. Um, and I don't know how, how much you have to wash it to get rid of death cap residue. I don't know. Um, but if they, if there's no residue there, she might get away with it if she's guilty. And I'll say if she's guilty, I'm only alleging that I'm saying that if she's guilty, this is the way I think it went down if she's guilty. And I don't know that she is. Uh, she hasn't been proven guilty. They haven't come up with enough to prove her guilt. Um, but, you know, like, like I pointed out, lots of, so, way too many strange coincidences. Oh, wasn't it a quinky dink that she didn't get sick? Wasn't a coincidence that her children ate leftovers and didn't get sick? Wasn't a coincidence that she, she forages for mushrooms? Isn't it a coincidence that death caps are in the area and probably don't show up in dried mushroom packs? Isn't it a coincidence no one else died of dehydrated Chinese mushrooms. It's no coincidence she didn't ever use those mushrooms before and people got sick like herself. Uh, what all the other coincidences? Uh, isn't a coincidence that a year prior their husband got ill and almost died in a very similar circumstance? That's a lot of coincidences. A whole lot. Um, um, well, is it her habit to pre pre prepare the plates? If not, that's good circumstantial evidence. Well, yes, it, if this ends up being a 100% circumstantial case, I don't think you could convince a jury that that's the problem that, you know, uh, and, and in reality, do I think she's guilty at this point? Let me say this. <laughs> I lean heavily in that direction. If I were on a jury and I just heard the story I told, might I believe she committed this crime? Yes. Would I convict her? Not being absolutely sure that she had possession of death cat mushrooms and that she purposely put them in, in the food. In theory, let's, let's, let's see, um, if I were a defense attorney right now, I might say, <laughs> what might I say? I'm trying to come up with a good defense here, that she did forage for mushrooms and she didn't realize she had death cap mushrooms and, after, and she dehydrated them and she put them in the darn beef wellington, but she had no clue that there were death cap mushrooms. And after everybody died, she not only panicked and got rid of the food dehydrator, but she also threw away 
or claimed, she said, I, I claimed they got the Chinese mushrooms because I didn't want to admit that I had dehydrated some poisonous mushrooms that I accidentally forged. I didn't know. But of course, we have the problem of why she didn't get sick. I think that is the key. You know, why didn't she get sick? You know, if everybody else got sick. Now, whether a defense attorney could claim that somehow she, yes, somehow she only put the death mushrooms on one half the in the duke's, duke cell. She only put the death mushrooms in half the duke cell. And she, she put an X on that end of the loaf. And then on the other end of the loaf, she acts, she got the, she got, I don't know, how would that work? <laughs> Wait a minute. I take that back. I can't even work that way. For a defense attorney, you can't say she put it on one half of the loaf because that makes her guilty. So she would have to have put the poison in the entire loaf. And she would have had to have gotten lucky to get a slice that had less poison in it. No, I, nobody's going to go for that one. That, that one just doesn't work. It, it, the problem she's having is that she didn't get sick. But whether you can convince a jury of that in a, in a totally circumstantial case, I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Um, oh. Yeah, it's it, it's not a true crime show. It's it's a it's a mystery series. It's called Death in Paradise. Um, it's a, a British series. It's on. I think we're going into we. I say we because I'm a fan. Uh, into like I think we're in uh, season fourteen coming up in January. Um, the first season is I absolutely love the first season. You can find it on Amazon Prime, um, and it is. It's a fish out of water story. You got a little, you know, a Caribbean island and and you end up with this guy from the UK as a fish out of water. And each one of the detectives that comes over, uh, detect, uh, they, he, they's um, got some kind of quirky thing about him, you know, that some weird thing. And then and so the so the police there that end up working with them when they first the guy first comes, they're like, oh, my God, we have to deal with this this, this idiot or freak or whatever he is. And they're not thrilled, but then when they find out he's brilliant and can solve crimes, then they start liking him and they get along with his weirdnesses. Uh, so each one of the detectives is kind of like Doctor Who and is eventually his new detectives um, as the actor, main actor, gets tired of, of, <laughs> of spending so much time on the island away from family. So then they finally get exhausted and quit and then they have to have a new new detective show up from uh, England. And uh, But it's, it's a very pleasant, it's kind of a... It's just a very pleasant. It's a be everything's beautiful there. People are super friendly. It's it's just very laid back. It's very it's just a relaxing thing. In spite of the fact somebody gets killed in the first five minutes, but other than that, there's not. It's not a violent show. It's not. It's not. It's not depressing. It's not like some of these shows where they always have the creepy music and you always have to hear these horrible backstories and none of that. It's just. It's just a fun. You know, something happens and they got to figure out the puzzle. And then there's all this wonderful camaraderie between between the uh, the detectives and the, the the other officers. It's just it's just a lovely show, and uh, you know it's not you know yeah it's not true crime. It's a, it's a it's a fictional mystery, but a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, although I like Death in Paradise a whole lot better, Midsummer Murders kind of drives me crazy, but <laughs> it bored me to death. I don't know what it was, <laughs> but I know Midsummer Murders is super paradise. Oh, oh, you love, <laughs> you love the lizard. Yes, there's a cute lizard on there. Yes, there's a, and he's, it's this, it's this little gecko lizard and he's adorable. And, um, but, uh, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a C CGI generated or whatever. And uh, I, you know, I actually thought it, it looked real to me. And then, and he, but, you know, they got him doing these cute things. So he has a cute little lizard. <laughs> Um, the defense will need to prove there weren't two loaves. Why do they have to prove that? You can't prove a negative. If there's no, if, it's, if the, if the, if the, if the, if the prosecution proved there were two loaves, then we'd have a case. But unless they can prove there were two loaves, then she would say, I've cooked it. I don't know why I didn't get sick. I don't know. You know, you're, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna convict me because I didn't get sick. I ate from the same loaf. See, that's your story. She ate from the same loaf. She says that. 
although she didn't cut it at the table. So we don't know that she ate from the same loaf, you see. That's why I think there's a second loaf. But how do you prove a negative? Unless if they found a pan that had two, you know, that, you know, you, where you lay them on the pan and there's shapes of two of them. Yeah, then there, you might be able to prove there's two. But otherwise, how do you prove it? Now, if they could prove she bought two pieces of this meat, that would be interesting. If she proved she had to buy more pastry than you need for one, that could be interesting. But again, I don't know if that's enough proof. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Walter Matilda says, I I'm wondering what else Patterson threw out from the kitchen. Can the teenage kids testify as to what dishes and utensils are missing? Um, here's what we don't know. We're not on the inside of the investigation. They, they may have much more info. They did search her house. So I don't know what they found in her house. I'm sure they went through that kitchen with a fine tooth comb. I'm sure they're looking everywhere. And then they found the dehydrator. So they got that. If there's, if they find poison, uh, a death cat, anything in that dehydrator, she's done. That's over. No question about it. They don't need to know about a second loaf. <laughs> she's just done. Unless, wait, I take that back. Well, I say the, the defense attorney would have her change her story to, yes, I dehydrated the death caps, but I didn't know they were death caps. It was an accident, and I just didn't want to admit that, I, oh, my God, they're going to blame me because I actually was my fault, but I didn't realize they were death caps. It was an accidental death because I didn't know those mushrooms are death caps. I was just terrified, though, that I was going to go to prison for the rest of my life because I made a mistake. So I said I got Chinese mushrooms in order to try to cover my mistake. That, that's what the defense attorney will do. You see, and I wanna, want you to understand how defense attorneys work. And this is what I, I have been called in on this stuff before. And that's why I don't usually work for defense attorneys. They would call me in and they would say, Pat, we got, okay. So they got this evidence on her. What do you think? What, what can you come up with as an alternative scenario that will get our client off? And as a profiler, I can look at this and I can come up with an alternative. She did indeed collect, forage the mushrooms. She thought they were healthy mushrooms. She dehydrated them. She had them in a bag. She wasn't even thinking about it. She used them in this. And then when everybody got sick, she's totally, you know, she freaked out and lied about the Chinese mushrooms and lied about the dehydrator. Now she can't, she's got the problem of why she didn't get sick. So if I were the profiler for the defense, which I will never be, um, somebody got a good, good one on that one. So we, we've got her accidentally picking death caps instead of other good mushrooms. She accidentally put them in the loaf. How, how does she get her out of not being sick? You got, she got away with the kids one. She said she scraped the mushrooms off because kids don't like mushrooms. I, it'll be interesting to see whether the children also testified to that or whether she just gave them the other loaf. <laughs> but what excuse would she have for not getting sick? That would be the trickiest part um, that they would have to come up with. Uh, so, oh, yeah, that, that is true. Harpa says her digital history would be interesting, and she might have been too careful to leave, but she might have been too careful to leave a trace of what she was planning. Except we see so many times that people do this. Now, I always point this out. They do it way back when they're thinking about it, and they're not saying they're going to do it. So they don't think, oh, I'm going to kill these people next week. I'm going to check this out. Well, what if the police look at my computer? They check it out like a few months prior. Like, I wonder if death caps will kill people. I wonder how much it takes. How long do they take to die? And then they forget about it for a while. And they decide, I'm going to do that death cap thing. And they forget that they searched that a month or two ago. That's what catches a lot of people. Because at the time, they weren't actually following through with it. And uh, so then they just put it out of their heads that they looked it up. Um <laughs> Stephanie says, I know vibes aren't anything to convict on, but she came off disingenuous in her driveway statement. Um, that's true. You can't convict on that. Uh, but a lot of times uh, people get very upset about when a police detective hones in on somebody because they have a weird vibe. They don't act normally for this particular situation. Um, 
And there are people who always in the defense of their people go, you know, everybody acts differently. You can't just say because a person didn't cry that they didn't care. You can't say because a parent didn't act a certain way when their child went missing that they killed them. You can't, you can't, you don't know how people act. This is true. It's not enough to convict, but it is enough to take a look at them and make them a person of interest. Because in general, there are things that you note over and over again. And when you don't note that thing, you go, that person's acting off, squirrely, not right. And therefore, you're going to look at them a little harder when they're acting that way. You know, it's, it's like anybody who acts suspiciously in some way or other is going to get looked at. If a, if a wife thinks her husband is acting suspiciously, she might think that guy's cheating on me with a secretary, you know, the old, the old secretary thing. But that's how, that's why people get, they get suspicious. Your kid starts acting weird. He starts acting very strangely. His behavior changes. You check his room for drugs, you know, because he might be on drugs. And then the kid goes, well, I don't know. Just because I act weird doesn't mean he has the right to go through my room. Oh, yes, it does. Because <laughs> you act like you're on drugs. You may not be, but the way you're acting makes me suspicious. So that's where you become a person of interest. Not, not that you're guilty but you become a person of interest and that's perfectly reasonable. And you have to do that. Uh, in the Brian Koberger case, when that first came out, one of the things I said, I said, there's basically uh, two possibilities here. One is they got to look at the boyfriend. Why do they have to look at the boyfriend? Well, because the boyfriend, she, she just had broken up with him. She dumped him. Um, there was some issue about the dog. She'd been calling him that night. He wasn't answering. They have to look at the boyfriend unless they find he's got an alibi and so on and so forth. Because a lot of times you have some brutal crime like that. It is the ex-boyfriend. I said the other possibility is an incel mass murder, which turned out to be what it was. But there are a lot of people who got pissed off at me and say, you're accusing the boyfriend. I'm like, I'm not accusing the boyfriend, ex-boyfriend. I'm saying they have to look at him. This is an educational show. I'm trying to say how you think as a detective, not what is absolute uh, because you um, we had the same thing with the uh, Rachel Morin case. She was heavily on social media. So people are still writing me and saying, hey, maybe it was somebody through social media. And I originally said, there's a lot of reasons to think that could be true. But then again, I said, people can be on social media. They can be involved in risky behaviors and still get killed by a serial killer on a jogging, on a walking trail. And so far, the police have said they believe it was random. Therefore, she was probably walking down the walking trail and she got attacked. So you have to look at the different possibilities and, you know, until you can rule them all out, you keep them on the plate, even if they're a small plate, you know? So, um, the what? Say what? Patreon decided to pull all the last names here today. I see all your last names. Is it what? Is it not? How? No, I'm, I'm, how is that? I don't understand what you're saying. Because I'm clicking on things, and your your whole your full names are coming up on the screen, so I don't see anything happening like that. Um. <laughs> you're an exception to every algorithm. I'm not squirrely enough. <laughs> well, and this is true. Um, by the way. You get people who are different, different than other people. They act in a different way. And this is where people always say, but but not everybody acts the same. That's true. And especially if you're kind of a unique person, you may come across really weird to people, totally weird to people, and people won't understand you. Uh, so, but, but it's unfortunate. I mean, you know, it's one of these things in life. It's just really unfortunate. Like, let's say um, you have a huge knife collection. Everybody knows you love knives and ninja stuff, and somebody gets murdered right behind your house by some really interesting ninja sword. You don't think they're going to look at you? <laughs> you poor sucker. <laughs> it's unfortunate you have a huge knife collection and you live right next to the murder victim that has a <laughs> some kind of <laughs> some kind of sword through them. That sucks. But, you know, that's what happens in investigations. And you can't really blame the police because they've got to, they can't ignore that stuff. It's just impossible. Same reason if you have a vehicle that looks just like the vehicle. That sucks too. You know, somebody says, hey, driving away from the, the driving away from the scene, I saw a little red Mazda Miata 
with a 60 some year old woman in it <laughs> with her hair pulled back and a ponytail, you know, and it's not me. It wasn't my Mazda and it wasn't me. But hey, would the police look at me and say, hey, where were you in the last little bit? Well, if they caught me driving home and I was out there and that they're going to pull me over. They have to. So it's unfortunate when you match a description or when you have a behavior that sends off little warning bells to people. It's just the way it is. And even the police have to work with, I can't ignore things just because people would like me to, or just to be nice. I, I can't, I can't do it. So, um, yeah, well, no, they can't ignore certain tips. <laughs> they have to ignore certain tips. One of the biggest problems police have is getting massive amounts of tips from lunatics. Um, so, the psychics that call, psychics that call, and people come and call just to blame their ex-husband. You know that gets tricky. People who just think they know something. People who watch too many shows like mine and say, "Oh, I know who did it." <laughs> I get that all the time. You know how many people send me tips? They tell me they absolutely know who committed a certain crime, and I absolutely know that they're not. That's not. That's not true. And then you get people who they might believe it, but then you get people who are, they're just crackers. They're just crackers. And so police have to deal with majority of the people are wrong. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, um, if you take the Rachel uh, Morin case, there's DNA at the scene. One guy did that. One guy in the entire United States. If they get in 3,000 different names and one of them is the right guy, that means 2,999 of those names are garbage. And 2,999 of those tips aren't good. <laughs> That's how much, that's what they got to deal with. It's a pain in the butt. Oh, Lord. <laughs> um, let's see. <laughs> oh, what, 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 you don't like the way the steak is? Oh, yeah, that you should definitely not cook steak at all. <laughs> First, personally, you know, I've been a vegetarian and vegan most of my life, but right now I'm doing keto because I'm desperate to lose the weight I gained during uh, COVID. So I'm eight pounds down now and I'm doing a keto diet, which is just not me. And, uh, but you know, if they give me tuna, I don't want to cook it. I like it raw. And personally, I think that's overcooked, but anyway, <laughs> as it should be. <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> Unless it's Mexican cooking, in which case they, they do some really they do. I don't know what they do when they make that carne asada, but they they cook, they cook their meat heavily. But they do some spice stuff that just fixes the whole thing. Um, oh, that's very good. One of the detectives in the Patterson case stated: detectives don't work operate on emotions; they operate on facts. And we do hope so. A lot of times there are detectives who operate on emotions, and that's problematic um, because you know. Detectives are human too, especially newer detectives, and, and certain things will bug them more than other things, especially crimes like with children uh, and murdered. Um, and they let their emotions start getting the best of them. We see it on we see it on um, all, you know all these different shows or the panels and stuff, and people coming on to talk. You'll see some of them get very emotional. Some of the detectives and profiles and stuff like that. Sometimes, and I'm like. I'm like, stop it. <laughs> you know, and, and you're talking about crime. You're talking about homicide. You're talking about facts. Don't try not to get over emotional. Now, once in a while, I do when I talk about the families, but when it comes down to the facts of the case, you know, I try to, you can't let emotions say, well, that's who would do such a thing? You know, well, whoever killed them, that's who did it. <laughs> so this is a Patterson though, not a Peterson. <laughs> Although I did write that wrong when I typed it, so I have to fix it. I think, yeah, I'm, I think I typed that wrong. It's supposed to be Aaron Patterson. I'll, I'll fix that when I put this public. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> my husband just said there's a reason he does all the cooking. <laughs> oh, there's so many other ways to poison your husband. He should know this. Uh, uh, oh, Lord. Um, Let's see. Um, my last name has always been visible. I, I I see everybody's name. I don't know. I don't know. You you're not required to put your name in here. You know, for, as far as pa Patreon goes, a lot of you use pseudonym names and fun names and all that stuff. And uh, some people use their real names. So, but whatever you put up is usually what shows up. So I haven't seen anything different. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Oh, that's a good point. Sometimes women whose faces are filled with Botox can appear emotionless. That is very true. When they're not, you can get a false read. Yeah, there's this new there's this new movie out and it's got oh, forgot her name now. Dang it, uh, the one in oh, it's been so I forgot now. But anyway, the husband says something like, uh, you know, well you got Botox and you, you know you can have no expression. She goes. No, look, look, I have expression. <laughs> it just stays there. <laughs> Solid. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. People that don't get Botox are deaf people. Uh, deaf people. I knew a guy, he got, he got something happened to him. And one of the things they wanted to do, they wanted to, they wanted to give him Botox. I forgot whether it was to kill the pain or something. And he refused to get it because uh, in sign language, you know, your grammar is on your face and you're, if you can't raise your, eyebrows up people aren't going to know if you're asking a question or not or with a statement and so you have to have your face has to be able to move and uh you know I, i've done sign language as i always used to be an interpreter so to me i have to be able to move my face it's like part of language for me it's like no you can't you can't freeze my face how am i going to talk you know it's like but but that's true if somebody does are botoxed out or you know, uh, maybe plastic surgery to death, they have less expression on their faces. So yeah, that's a very good point. Say so this, we have to look at those things. You have to take that into consideration. Um, <laughs> Miatas are so fun. Yes, they are. And that's why I still have mine. Uh, and if I buy my Miata dies, I'll probably get another one. I love them. I love the Miata. Um, it's just, it's not good in the rain and, and you can just get out and spin around but if you're not doing that if you're doing country roads at the top down it's fun it's a fun and i said i do have a stick I, you, can't, you can't drive a miata without you know being able to shift you know what's the point doesn't it makes it a lousy sports car if you have you can't shift into different gears you know that's fun um let, uh maybe she can say Okay, this is a good, this is a good thing. Maybe she can say she ate less than the others and weighs more so she didn't eat enough to be poisoned. She does, did say she was sick and had diarrhea. So I would think, yes, all right. I think you've got the, the best defense case possible. Uh, the real question will be, when they did the initial interrogation and interviews, which, by the way, she lawyered up really quick and then gave a statement. That's another thing she did, which was interesting. Um, you would have to ask in the initial interview, did you eat your entire piece? I, I wouldn't want to say, did you eat the same amount as everybody else? Did you, but you see, you have to put, yeah, we can't, yeah. you have to be careful how you ask a question because you don't want to give them the answer. Everybody got really sick. Did you eat a piece that was the same size as theirs? He just gave them the answer. Then the answer is going to be, no, I didn't. My piece was really thin because I wasn't very hungry. Or, oh, no, I ate. Well, they all died of these mushrooms. Why didn't you? Well, like my children, I scraped the mushrooms off because I really don't like the mushroom part. But I do love the pastry and the ham and the beef. All depends on those early interviews because you have to catch them before they figure out the answer. By the time they get a defense attorney, the defense attorney will come up with the proper answer for them, which is why I loved. It just drives me crazy. I think that should be illegal. A defense attorney should not be able to provide scenarios for their their client. I, I, that's why I've always wanted to have a, a video camera. And I know everything's supposed to be private, but I've always thought there should be some video camera in there. And if they find out that they that that guy gave the story to them told them what to lie about they should that should be the end of them being a lawyer but it's not the way it works they're allowed to sit back there and create all the stories they want and tell that person exactly what they want them to say in court and so they can go up there and they will commit perjury if they allow them to testify in court they'll commit perjury all the way and if it's if they don't let them testify then the defense attorney will go up there like jose Baez, make up a story he's allowed to lie through his teeth and he, he's not saying, I'm going to make up a story for you. He's not saying that. He's saying, this is what happened. He's a liar. And that's allowed in a court of law. You as a witness are not allowed to lie. If you commit perjury, you go to prison. But the defense attorney can perjure the living heck out of himself. And as a matter of fact, so can the prosecution. And so can the defendant. Now, isn't that interesting? <laughs> as long as somebody gives you the story to tell. Mm. Uh
Oh, okay. Pat, did you go over whether or not she truly researched fungi or it was gossip? Was she truly in a fungi or not? Okay, that, that actually is a good question. Um, the answer to that would be, it. there were friends that said she was a forager. Now, obviously, I'm not an investigator. See, here's, here's one of the big problems. I'm going by the media. Maybe I should just make this statement every time. I'm going by what I can read in the media. I'm not working the case. If I were working the case, I would absolutely know what was what whether she herself said she did foraging, whether friends said she did foraging, whether her ex-husband decided to say she did foraging, whether a friend who said she did foraging just because she hates her now. <laughs> um, I don't have any access to any of that. I have access to what you have, which is the media, which had this information there, which doesn't mean the information is correct. So that's a good point to make. Um, so some, sometimes I've been called out because, you know, I read something in the media when I'm talking about cases and it turns out to be garbage, which a lot of the media is. Um, all I, and then they said that then they, they libel me all over the place. So, you know, um, and they're major media when you're major media, uh, I think it's important for major media not to tell a story where they don't verify where they get everything from, but there's no journalism left and more in the world pretty much. So. Um, and then what they do is when one, one person, one person puts out the story, let's say it's put out by 60 minutes, then you'll see it in seven, 70, 80, 700 places. We'll just take the story and steal it and, and re regurgitate it without doing their own investigation. So, yeah. And that's why, again, I say this is an educational channel. I'm not here to say anybody is guilty or not guilty. I'm not trying to solve the crime. I'm trying to show you how one thinks through the crime with it with the knowledge that's available to the public or has been given to the public by either the police or the media. Um, now, if it gets down to a specific thing about a case where, uh, you know, I, I say if the police haven't said that, I'm not going there at all. Just, you know, on certain cases, I'm not going to even talk about it. It's a bunch of, whole bunch of gossip, you know, that's going around. Uh, uh, this, per this guy did this and this person did that. And you don't know. Um, but death caps, death caps were in the area that she lived in. We can say that. So, uh, could she do an internet search just to find out what to avoid? I would want to know what to avoid. Well, you, you can do an internet search on literally anything and you can do a private internet search and doesn't retain your, your search or the, the, doesn't retain the search, nor does it retain the website you went to, which is why everybody goes there to go to Pornhub. But, um, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a computer. I can never, I've forgotten this crap. I don't know whether if you did a, a, somebody got your hard drive and did a computer search, whether that information would still be there. I, you know, it, things change so rapidly in the computer world and I'm not a techie. So I don't know whether somebody could still get that information off of your drive that you did certain searches. Even if you, even if you erase the searches, got rid of all your searches, I don't know where that could be found. I don't know quite how that all works. <laughs> <laughs> you really didn't don't help me be open-minded honest <laughs> i'm not sure i know what that means <laughs> that's, that's terrible <laughs> what was that one loretta says i went foraging for mushrooms and found the solution to intrusive in-laws <laughs> well there you go sometimes it works that way um i actually have only done mushroom foraging once in my life um I was invited to go there and I got those orange mushrooms they are called chanterelles. They're real expensive if you buy them and they're hard to find fresh. And I, the guy who was doing it was, a, I, and now I question, he was supposedly an expert. Now I think maybe I shouldn't have done that, but man, those are like the best mushrooms I ever ate in my life. Those are so good, <laughs> but I don't know if I'd do it twice. <laughs> I, did, I, I did say porn hub, you know, I mean, it's the most well-known, sight around right <clears throat> and uh so yeah <laughs> but that's why people go people go on private so that their wife or their husband or whomever doesn't find that they they have Pornhub as one of the places they went to because you know what happens is if you type in you know you start typing in a search you start typing in a, uh, an address it'll pop right up if that you know somebody can come there and put po and if 
if you didn't if you didn't put Popeyes in, you know, it'll come up Pornhub, you know, <laughs> or it'll go Popeyes and then Pornhub. You know, oh, who's been looking? Who's been at Pornhub? So they go to the the private thing that won't retain that, at least not to the family. I don't say I don't know in deeper situations with the police get a hold of it, but yeah. <laughs> You never been to Pornhub, huh? I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, yeah, that, that's. I think the two Wellingtons is to me that's the most logical, the logic most logical method. And since she did seem to like crime stuff and seem to like being clever, I, I say the the cleaning thing. I think is pretty pretty good. I wish you know. She was very rich, so she could afford to just have people come in and clean and leave. Um, and I guess it depends where your house is, whether people see the cleaning people show up or not. But, you know, I mean, I wish I'd done that. Look, honey, I have to clean the house today. And he's like, man, you're the best wife ever. Look how gorgeous it is. <laughs> yes, I, I've worked so hard all day. Would you take me to dinner? It's like, <laughs> oh, my God. I think I think that's pretty smart. Although lying to your husband is 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 not a good thing for marriage. It makes me question that you are you have some kind of issues. <clears throat> um, <laughs> oh, you've got chanterelles. Oh, really? Oh, in the backyard, drilled holes and logs and put the spores in. Oh, that's a cool idea. <gasps> well, maybe if if you do it yourself, then I guess you'd know you're getting chanterelles, so that would be safer. Oh, I, mean, I should try that because yeah, I love those things. Uh oh, yeah. <laughs> Many people have said they were doing research, and that's why you have those weird, creepy searches. <laughs> but you're right. Um, I've had more creepy searches on my computer than many people, especially when I'm looking, uh, when I'm dealing with uh, certain peculiar sexual homicides. Uh, and um, yes, I, there's things that you just can't even imagine people do, you know, um, and then you have to look them up to see how that fits into the homicide you're working on. And I said, I, I pointed out, you know, a number of times that I've, you know, I did that one time when I was posing as a 15 year old uh, and a guy liked to drown me on the internet. This was called men underwater. It was actually a website where you, one man would drown the other one. That was a sexual thing. And um, I posted as 15 year old. So if people looked into my, <laughs> into my search engines and where I was going, I'm going to men underwater.com where people are committing sexual homicides against other men underwater. And so people would really question me, but you know, that, that's part of the work you do. You know, it's like, I, I know way too much. <laughs> way too much. <laughs> I am not catfishing men underwater, <laughs> but you know, you, you read about these things, you know, when, when you're looking through paperwork or you're looking into whether a person would commit a certain kind of crime and you see, Oh, I see they got fetishes that are concerning. And then how are those fetishes played out? Are these fetishes that are going to be played out in real life? And this guy was said he wanted to be the next Jeffrey Dahmer. And so the question was, was he looking for a real victim that he could drown in a river drown in a lake, drown in his own bathtub, for example. And as a matter of fact, he did almost kill a guy. Um, uh, he, how did he do that guy? I don't, he didn't drown him. He uh, put him in plastic bags, I think, to suffocate him. So he did a different thing with him. The guy escaped. So, yeah. So that guy was a, that one guy was a, a real threat to society. Um, and um, so we're trying to find out, you know, how obsessed he was with this and did he want to carry it out into the real world and also to learn a lot of other details about him. So that's why I posed as a 15 year old. And uh, but, you know, you <laughs> it's like, well, that that that's pretty disgusting, you know. So um, never heard of I never heard of such a thing. Oh, you just haven't been around long enough. I mean, you know, <laughs> I've done my work. I've heard of pretty much everything. But every once in a while I go, I do once in a while. I've like, I like no, like two, two to 300 different fetishes that have come through the, my work over 30 years. And then one day I'm like, seriously, I never thought of that one. <laughs> That's a new one on me. Like one of the most interesting ways of serial homicide, which came out in the, when AIDS got very big in the early days of AIDS before they had anything to help you. Um, there were guys 
a couple guys that got they they got became HIV positive, and then they purposely had sex unprotected with other men to give them HIV, and to know that they therefore killed many people. That's a, that was an interesting version of serial homicide because they were serial killers. And uh, I don't think much has been written up about that. Um, but that's because well, the guy died too. So, you know, you, you couldn't even at that point, he was going to die. So he couldn't, couldn't convict him of anything because he was already on the way out. But he would then, you know, just have go to bathhouses in different places and get a kick out of how many people he gave HIV to. And so that's serial homicide. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, the, oh, the, the, there was, um, yeah, that, I don't know. Was, I don't know. There's a Japanese guy. I know there's a German guy. Cause I, I did a book. Um, I actually edited and did the profile in a book called, um, do I have it on my shelf? Um, what the heck was the name of it? Uh, shoot. I forgot. That's a German dude. It was a German guy and he did advertise and the guy, willingly came to be killed and eaten willingly um so then it was an interesting question what kind of crime was it hmm. so go figure um uh so yeah so there's a um Oh, uh, this is interesting. Uh, Harper says probably two Wellingtons and she did plan it thoroughly. So she knew how to feign symptoms such as a tummy upset and maybe pretend to be on a diet and dislike mushroom. So she wouldn't have ingested enough. Yeah. I don't know what she said at the hospital. You see, this is where, this is where it's really important to get early information on interviews and so on and so forth, because that's where you screw up because as one says, the truth stays the same, but when you start when you, the story starts changing up, it's usually a lie. So sometimes what happens is in the, in the thrill of what occurred and under the stress of what occurred, people jump to a story too quickly because they, they'll suddenly they're questioned and they go and they answer it. But what was their answer right away? What was their answer? What was her answer when she supposedly went to the hospital? They said she really didn't have anything. What was her answer to the doctors? Did the doctors proceed? Didn't, a lot of times the right questions aren't asked. And when the right questions aren't asked, you lose that opportunity. So if you just say, what happened? Oh, well, I made a dinner for uh, all of my friends and we all got sick. Th there's no information there. So unless somebody asked her specific questions where they could catch her by then having her change a story. Now, like the dehydrator thing, she changed the story. From way back, I threw, threw it away back to, oh, no, after I like discussed the dehydrator at the hospital, my ex-husband said, did you use it to poison people? And then I ran out and got rid of it. Okay, she changed her story. So that one, they got her in. Uh, but the rest of it, 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 it's part of the investigation. And I don't know how well, well, well you know, they're going to see uh, what's, you know, how much her story has changed. And she did lawyer up really quickly. She didn't really want to give a statement to the police which is interesting as well. Why not? I mean, theoretically, you had no idea what happened. Or did she? <laughs> or did she? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's true. Uh, but she planned it with the, the lawyer. So I, you know, I, I think it was a statement she gave. I don't even know if she's given a real interview yet. Uh, she gave a statement. So yeah, and the lawyer is going to be sure uh, that she's not going to say anything. Um, Hear from we're interested to hear from the husband. He suspected her right away, it seems. Yes, it does. I mean, his parents are dying. Um, and he was sick a year ago. He's probably extremely suspicious. She did something to them, and that's why he did say that. And and because he asked about um, did, is that how you poison them when they're talking about the food dehydrated? He he must know something about her dehydrating something. That's why I wonder whether she has been dehydrating mushrooms in the past. And um so that'll, that'll come out later. I think we'll get a, a more conclusive information on whether she was a, there's more information on her being a, a mushroom forager. Um, um, the case with the AIDS thing was frustratingly not treated like a serial killing, more like he was just not caring or negligent. Well, you know, I don't think it was even recognized. You see what I'm saying? It's just, they're thinking, He's just not thinking, <laughs> you know, he knows he has HIV, but he wants to have partners and 
he just didn't, you know, he's their willing partners. They didn't, they, they didn't use a condom, you know, it's, hey, it's, you know, they, 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 everybody made their own choices, uh, which they did. It's true. But, but that, you know, there were, I mean, it wasn't, mo some of them did just have sex again without thinking, but there, there were, I can't remember. I know there was definitely one. I, I think there was at least two that specifically, and I think there was, oh, I'm trying to remember that. Guy. I'm going to have to look that up. There's specifically one guy and I forgot how many guys he, he infected, but he, he infected a lot of people on purpose. And he said he did it on purpose because he was mad that he, he, he was, he had AIDS or HIV at the time. I don't know if he was already all, all the way to AIDS yet or not, but um, it was, it was a real different time uh, when, you know, I was working in the hospital in the 1990s and uh, I've dealt with um, people who were already at the AIDS stage and there was nothing to save them. Um, and it was pretty brutal. Um, so, and now at least they've got good concoctions um, which can save somebody. Uh, and I've now, I now I, I know one person who's, I think, been HIV positive. She's been HIV positive for 20 some years now and she's doing okay. And that's really, that's really great. But that wasn't the way things used to be. It was a death sentence back in the day. Pretty horrifying, uh, really horrifying. Um, I actually interpreted for a deaf woman who, huh, she, she um, was with her husband and um, she came in with her husband. She was pregnant and they came back in and said, we, we need to tell you that you're HIV positive. And I interpreted that. And the husband flipped out and he just went like this and ran out of the room. And the doctor ran out of the room, leaving me with a patient who was now completely stunned and start, she started crying. And then her husband came back in. He didn't sign. He actually, they were, she was trying to lip read him. And, uh, and she said, and I remember this, I guess I interpret for them. And then she said, if, if you want to leave, if you want to separate, I accept. And he said, I love you. You are my wife and I'll never leave. And I was like, eh. <laughs> it was like, I had that. Okay. There was a time I had trouble not crying <laughs> and he did never leave her. He stayed with her to the day she died and she did die eventually of AIDS. Um, she's a beautiful, beautiful woman. She had actually been raped and she was not a drug user or anything. She was just really bad luck. So, <laughs> but uh, he was, he stayed with her. Yeah. So good guy. Good guy. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah, well, you, you know, the difference, the difference is not disclosing is wrong and you can get in legal trouble. Right. But there's a difference between doing that and doing it on purpose to kill people. And that's why I said this was an interesting thing of somebody essentially poisoning other people, poisoning of the disease on purpose. So it's a, it is a version of serial homicide, very similar to, Lucy Letby, killing the babies in the hospital, you know, one after the other, after the other. And this was a, just a different version of that with somebody who was, you know, not a, not a sexual serial killer, you know, and this person that wasn't sexual homicides. It was, let me have sex with you and kill you, <laughs> you know? So, but that's the way some things work, you know? Um, and we, people don't understand there's very, so many different versions of serial homicide. And there's also different versions of mass murder and there's different versions of family annihilation. This being one of them. If, if she's guilty, let me always put the F in there. If she's guilty, <laughs> but anyway, I thought this was a super interesting case and uh, check out if you haven't ever watched uh, death in paradise, it's, it's a, it's a really good show. And, and it's always about the puzzle. And sometimes the puzzles are outrageously ridiculous um, where you go, there's no way, <laughs> you know, that that person would have planned such a clever crime and it wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been able to pull it off. I mean, I, I say that all the time. It's like, no, that, you know, to have it happen that way, probably not. Could it happen? Yes. But only because a very clever writer made this very fancy, fancy, fancy crime, which most, no, most people don't commit. Most people commit really dumb crap crimes. And when they decide they're going to kill somebody, it's usually not very fancy. But every once in a while, you get somebody who is a little bit better at creating a, a, a clever scenario. And this might be one of them. But we'll have to wait and see whether they're able to what, what they're able to prove in this. I, I don't know what the uh, 
um, the uh, detectors are going to come up with. So, yeah, we shall see. Oh, another person who likes Death in Paradise. Ah, oh, you were sad about Martha. Why, Martha? Why would you be sad about Martha? She she got married to what's his name, and they went off, and they have a new series called uh, After Paradise. It takes place in uh, some small island in, in the UK somewhere. <laughs> So I don't know. What's my, why are you sad about Martha? <laughs> I'm confused. Um, <laughs> uh, Lord, <laughs> when I close my eyes, I see the two beef wellingtons. I'm getting hungry, and I did eat my one OMAD meal. I did, I'm doing one meal a day. So you only get one chance, and I have to get up tomorrow, have coffee, and wait till evening. About 4 or 5 o'clock, I eat my second my one meal a day. Yeah, but... Um, Yes, it's um, uh, okay. What, you asked where Death of Paradise is filmed. It is filmed on um, it's uh, Guadeloupe. I think it's Guadeloupe. I think it's Guadeloupe. Um, no, now we're gonna, now I'm gonna have to look it up for you. <laughs> Luckily, I have my iPad right here, and I always forget where which which island it's on. But it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, where is where where is Death of Paradise? Where is Death in Paradise filmed? It is it's Guadeloupe. It is Guadeloupe. Okay, I was right. How about that for once? Uh, yes, the program is filmed in Guadeloupe, a group of five islands in the Southern Caribbean Sea, shaped like a butterfly, and it's not right between Dominica and Antigua. Um, and it's, um, yes, yeah, a fictional island of Saint Marie. And um, I just, I really enjoy it because, you know, I used to be married to a Jamaican. So, uh, you know, I've been to Jamaica a lot. I've been to the uh, other islands, and I love, you know, a lot of. I like the reggae, and I like the the, the sound of the the, the uh, accents and the uh, versions. I like Jamaican English and patois and all that. So it's it's just it's comfort, comforting to me, and uh, so I, I like to watch. And I love I love the tropics, and I like palm trees. <laughs> and if I were going to work for a police department, I would sign up for that police department in a heartbeat. Ah. <laughs> the Jamaican bobsled team. Got to give them credit. That's 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 quite amazing. That was a that was a cute movie. Definitely a cute movie. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to that. Well, we don't know there is a trial yet. We don't know if she's uh, going to be arrested. Uh, you know, they have to have enough uh, uh, evidence to arrest her. It has to be probable cause. Um, you know. So yes, it is French, by the way. Yes, the the uh, the Guadeloupe. Yes, um, French French uh, island. Um, oh, okay. There you go. Uh, <laughs> by the way, while I was talking about the Botox thing, what's her name that's on Seinfeld? That was a show I was trying to think of. What's her name on Seinfeld? She's got the new movie out. It's on Amazon Prime right now. It looks it looks amusing. I'm going to have to go watch it because it looks like a good comedy. But she talked about the, the Botox and then her face didn't move and it was pretty funny. So, uh, 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 what's her name? I mean... Eileen, yeah, yes, it's Julia Louise Dreyfus, and that's she's in the new movie. It just came out on Amazon Prime. Um, so, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, they did find the. Oh, sorry, they did find the dehydrator. Uh, they just haven't said what the testing has come up with yet. Um, and where do you watch that? Uh, I found well, two places. One is you can get it on um, Amazon Prime. I think you have to pay for it. Um, they might have a free season, but you have to pay for it, I think. And used to be on Netflix, but I think it's been pulled. I watch it on uh, BBC when it comes out, but then I, I use a VPN. Um, so if I don't, I, I've seen some in the U.S. I can't watch British shows because they won't, I, they won't allow me to. So I use a VPN and then you just go to BBC and they ask you for a, a postcode, I think it is. And then I just steal one from London and chuck it in there and, and then I can watch the shows. <laughs> Oh, I am a crook. Oh, no. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but I don't understand why you can't watch no matter where you're from. And I don't mind paying for it. I mean, I'm, I don't mind being an outsider paying for it. But it bugs me when you know it's someplace and you can't watch it because you're not physically sitting in the country. But um, but yes, that's how I do it. So the new season in January, uh, I, pay for a v I pay yearly for a VPN because I have to find sometimes information from uh, documentaries like Australia that I can't see in the U S then I can go on the VPN, put myself in Sydney and pull up the documentary. So I use it a lot. Um, so I pay for the yearly thing on the VPN. I use express VPN and no, I'm not shilling for them. Although I wish they pay me because I think that's one, one company that might 
support this channel one day, ExpressVPN and also Sunbasket, because that's where I'm getting my, my meals from. Uh, I love Sunbasket. They have fabulous, fabulous um, recipes. It's just incredible. Um, every time I eat, I think, God, this is better than a restaurant. And it comes to my door and I don't have to do shopping. It's great. Um, <laughs> it costs a little bit more, mm, but I'll show for them too if they want to support the channel. <laughs> it's only two things I can think of that, you know, that I, I really like well enough to, you know, to, if that, I'm going to earn money for the channel, I want to do it with something I approve of and truly, truly like and would recommend to people and not just, hi, you should go here and buy this. And I think, ah, oh, hell no. I would never do that to you guys. So, <laughs> Wait a minute. No, well, no, no. The postcard you no, no, the TV license. All I do is pick out a general postcode. It's not it's not a person's postcode. It's just you just look at the London postcodes and you just pick any of them and chuck them in. <laughs> so yes, that's how so it I don't know. It's 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 uh it's kind of a kind of a weird system that it's not very uh very closed. So and I, that's what you do with, with a VPN. You just, any any country you go to that requires that you have a TV license, essentially, you just give them a postcode and pick one out of the hat. It's very strange, but it sucks. But, you know, so, <laughs> no, I don't want to get kicked back. They, 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 you know, they, some, some, you know, sometimes you'll get the, you know, the, they'll want to advertise on the channel. And I would, you know, because since, since uh, YouTube constantly seems to be taking our, our advertising money away. They keep chipping away at it. If somebody was supporting the channel through, you know, advertise, uh, having me, um, a sp specific product, I would do it because I need to support the channel, but it has to be something I truly believe in. I'm just, I just, I can't, I cannot sell anything. I don't 100% think it's great. So yeah. My, <laughs> your phone thinks you're in Beijing. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah. Sun basket and VPN. Yeah. Those are the two so far that I, 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 I use and I really think they're, they're very, very they're great for me. And so I really, really like them. I can't, I can't think of anything else at this point that I would support. I mean, I'm not a techie. So, I, you know, it's not like I can say you should be using this camera. You should be using this computer program. I, I don't sell makeup. I, you, know, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I don't have any of those things. It's just those are two things that I think are good. So there we go. <laughs> Pornhub, maybe Pornhub will. <laughs> no, that would really be terrible. <laughs> um, you can't have a VPN unless you pay for it. It costs money. And it, uh, some uh, now people don't just use VPN for that. A lot of people use VPN because VPN uh, makes your safer computer because you don't. They, it's, it prevents you from a lot of uh, hacking. So a lot of people use VPNs to prevent hacking, not because they're trying to show up in other countries but it, it is very useful sometimes when you even when you're traveling and certain places in the world are very hard to log on to anything if you're if you can't log on through to that exact location it's just, it just doesn't work well <laughs> no i'm never going to do porn <laughs> i have some standards for god's sake um <laughs> uh brit box huh I don't, I don't know. Death in Paradise? Death in Paradise is on BBC. And I know BritBox you can pay for. Um, if you're an American, you can pay for BritBox. Um, and they have a lot of different you know, shows. Um, but um, I didn't think Death in Paradise was on there. But I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I pay for most of my Death in Paradise. I watch it. I watch it on BBC and then I pay for it on Amazon Prime just because I like to have the back, the back ones. I mean, I just because I sit there and watch them over again. And I hardly ever do that with shows. I don't like watching things more than once. But I love that show. It makes me happy. I can just pretend I'm on that island and, you know, being a part of the team down there. <laughs> You're just terrible. <laughs> You're terrible. You do know that Pornhub is free. <laughs> it's free, folks. That's why it does so well. Mm. So anyway. <laughs> okay. I'll stop this conversation before it gets off the rails anymore. Okay. So. Yeah, so I got through the show without the, the, the internet crashing this time. So I don't know what that was all about. But so the hurricane is coming to the U.S. right now. I don't know if it's going to hit the East Coast. Uh, we're, I'm supposed to be at the beach next weekend at Ocean City, Maryland. Um, but if the rains come in, it's going to kill what we were planning to do there. So um, 
So next weekend, uh, I'm probably going to do the show on Sunday, uh, and it may be later on Sunday. Uh, if I come, if I'm at the beach through Saturday, then I'll probably do it uh, on. I'll come back on Sunday, so I'll do it. It might be another evening show. Maybe I have to do another uh, New Zealand Australian show or something, <laughs> and uh, um, because I'm going to do a later show. Um, but I didn't see some of my favorite uh, people from Australia aren't here today. So anyway. <laughs> Um, oh, I hope, nah, nah, no, don't even worry about that algorithm stuff. I mean, people think they, there's, oh, that they say this or say that and that, believe me, no, I, nobody understands the algorithm at YouTube at all. I have no clue why sometimes it does well for me. And sometimes I think like, Hey, you hate me this week. <laughs> you know? It's, 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 it is what it is. And I, 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 you know, people who want to get into YouTube, there's 30 million channels and only one quarter of 1% make even a penny. It's that bad. And the majority of people who make a penny literally make a penny, maybe 50 bucks a month. Um, so for anybody to even make a living wage on the, on YouTube, it's very difficult. And of course you see the, the ones you go to because the algorithm is throwing them up to you. You're like, well, I see all these people are making, look at Dr. Grande is doing well. Ken Mans is doing great now. I know, you know, and the, you can point out all these people are doing well. They're doing well because they either have been here a really long time and been successful over seven, 10 years. And finally the algorithm has pushed them up to the top for advertising. But you're only seeing a very small amount of channels when you consider this 30 million out there. So the fact that you can even find me, <laughs> it's a good thing. I, I'm doing well enough at least to survive now. Um, but uh, you know, but how the algorithm works, nobody knows. You know, it's not even worth the end. I used to walk, look at these things. How should I make my channel better? I gave that crap up. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to do what I like doing. It either, you know, I either survive or I don't. But I, I, I can't spend all my time figuring out, should I have improved this? Should I have done this at Thursday night at 6 o'clock rather than Friday night at 7 o'clock? Well, when is the best time of the week to put your shows out? <laughs> it's too much of a headache. Eh, it's, it's just not worth the effort. <laughs> I don't have the energy to... And a lot of people spend all this time trying to figure it out. And guess what? They don't figure it out anyway. So I'd rather put my energy into doing the research, watching the shows I need to watch, reading the books I need to read, doing the shows with you. Yeah, that's where I want to put my energy and not into trying to figure out how to do better. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Twice the sub since you found me. Well, I'll tell you this. It took me a year and a half a year and a half to get to 6,000 subs and at 6,000 subs, I, I was, you know, starving to death. Uh, really. And I, I got to the point where I was trying to decide after a year and a half, 6,000 people sounds to some people that sounds great, but it's not, it's not, you can't, you can't live on that. Um, and I said to myself, how long do I keep doing this before I, you know, I can't do it voluntarily forever. I have to earn a living like every other human being. And, I have to at least, I don't have to make a million. I don't have to make a hundred thousand a year, but I have to earn something so I can put sun basket on my table, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, uh, it took me to, so it was a year and a half to get to 6,000. And then last October, the algorithm did something. And I, I, I shot up overnight. It was like, I, I clicked the button and I was like subscriber, like boom, 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 boom. boom. So now I have 33,000. So yes. Uh, and that's, so now, since last October, I've gone up to 33,000, which thank God, because I needed to get up to that level to even begin to break into minimum wage, you know? So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a toughie. And only because I have some other man, man, methods of survival uh, that I can do this even, uh, because, you know, if I, were, if I were 35 years old and I had children, uh, there's no way I could do this. I mean, I, this just wouldn't happen. This is a full-time job. People don't understand it. It's full-time. And you have to have some level of income to get you, keep you going until you can survive on YouTube money. If you, you know, if you can't do that, you can't, you can't do it at all. So, so you either have to live in your mother's basement <laughs> for five years so you can finally make it if you do, uh, or you have to have some other, you know, methodology of survival for at least two to three to four years. So not an easy thing, but I wanted to do this. So it's cool. You know, it's, it's going well and, uh, and I enjoy doing it and, and I see more and more things I want to do with the channel. Uh, and so I'm going to get to those things at some point. So 
yeah, it's an interesting ride. That's all I can say. Interesting ride. Um, but, <laughs> um, yeah, it, you know, it actually is. It's a lot of work. People don't realize it. But I'll say this. Some people have asked me in my lifetime um, what I like doing best about profiling and stuff. And I used to do a lot of television work. Um, I used to work full, pretty much full-time television work um, along with my other stuff. Um, and somebody said to me, if you were hired by a major police department tomorrow and you could be their profiler for all of their homicide cases and a major police department, would you quit TV? And I said, absolutely. A hundred percent. I'd be gone in, uh, gone in a second. And people said, really? Because I thought you loved, I thought you loved doing TV. I said, no, no. I like doing TV, but I really love profiling. I like analyzing crime. And with TV, you got to do a teeny bit of it, but usually they throw the story at you. And it's like, <laughs> it's like an hour before the dang show, you know, or maybe they call you at 10 in the morning and say, can you do the show at one o'clock? And they send you some, some crap over on an email. You read it, you go on the show and you say a few sentences and you leave. If you ever listen to people on these shows, they, they say a lot of very vague crap because you don't have time to study and research. I do for this show. I do spend time researching as much as I can. Now, sometimes I can't. There's just, you know, not enough information. But if I can, I read a book. I'll watch a documentary. I'll watch two documentaries. I will research across the Internet. I put a lot of and then I spend a lot of time thinking about it as opposed to just blurting out a few things. I think about it for days sometimes, sometimes a week or two. What, I'm, what am I going to what am I how am I analyzing this crime? And so I am actually getting to do crime scene analysis more so today than than I did during all those those TV days. Um, but I, I absolutely at the time, if I could have done profiling eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, just profiling, just analyzing crime for a police department, I would have done it. But police departments weren't hiring for that. So that never happened. So I did analyze crimes, but they were, you know, occasional because that's how things work in the profiling business. Um, but I would have done it full time round the clock if I could, because I like analyzing crimes. That's, that's my thing. <laughs> uh, oh, Jeffrey McDonald's. Yes. He was an interesting one. Uh, seems to be what decisive, decisive, like what? I'm not sure about that one. Oh, divisive. <laughs> oh, divisive. And oh, he's just a pain in the butt. But, you know, he's got, they got a problem with him because his DNA is at the crime scene. In spite of everybody thinking it was, not everybody, some people thinking it was planted. His DNA was at the crime scene. They got a lot on that guy. He's in trouble. I mean, people say, well, you really think he's guilty? It sure looks that way. So they're doing everything they can because they got issues trying to, they're going to have a real hard time getting him off. I mean, he brutally murdered four people in one night. I mean, it's 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 the kind of crime that people, that even the jury is going to have a hard time not wanting to find him guilty. You know, so they're, going, they're doing everything they can to try to toss stuff out there to slow things down, confuse people, whatever. But, um, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of the times they just don't have they, they aren't given the time to even talk. They, all these, the panel crap that you see on these shows, that's why I won't do them. Some people ask me, why aren't you on Surviving the Survivor, for example? I was, I was asked to be on that as a regular. I turned them down because I don't like panels. I don't like sitting there waiting to blurt out something and then having other people attack you. Or, you know, sometimes they have people on and then they attack you. And it's just, it's unpleasant. But I don't really get a chance to say anything useful. Um, I... Uh, and even when I just did News Nation, uh, 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 that was fortunate uh, only because um, I was talking about the, uh, the, uh, the Rachel Morin case. I wanted to get my, I really wanted to do, the, um, do my profile, the five bullet points on that profile. And uh, um, I was given a reasonable amount of time to speak, which was extremely unusual. But, but even then, I... I took, I just had to bulldoze through it and I did my five and I went, okay, I got mine in, <laughs> but you have to fight to do that because they have that time slot and they want to get you in and they want to get you out because people aren't, the people have short attention spans. They don't want to actually think too long on it. So there's a lot of, you know, you get there and people come in, they do their one or two minutes and 
they make themselves sound very intelligent. And then everybody goes, oh, that was interesting. That was so good. And then I, I'm listening going, but they didn't say anything. <laughs> you know, but that's the way it works. Oh, my God. Poor, poor Wendy. Wendy Murphy. <laughs> well, that stupid turtle boy that should crawl back in his shell. Um, <laughs> well, she was... She was losing her mind. See, that was the problem. She was just, she was losing her mind because the guy's such a jerk and he's such a liar and such a psychopath that she was like going, oh, "This is ridiculous," and and, and you know it's, that's why I don't do the show. So, not that you can't sometimes see something good on there, but it's just that's just not my thing. I can't listen to those panels; they drive me nuts. I I, I don't like them. I prefer to listen to anybody by themselves. You know, I always recommend the channels where a person spends a reasonable amount of time explaining stuff. And I don't always have to agree with what they're explaining, but at least I want to hear what they have to say. I want them to have enough time to say it. I don't want I don't want this constant, you know, change up. But some people like that. So, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, they, they don't because it's, it's a soundbite issue. And, and they go from one to another, to another, to another. And I have spent way too much of my life doing these very short sound bites. And sometimes you can't even, um, like when I was, like even when I was doing my, the thing on uh, Rachel Moore, the last statement I made was people don't like to rat other people out. And I got cut off right there. And so, a lot of people jumped on me for that. They're like, oh, what, what, you know, and, and he did too, Dan Abrams. He's like, well, Pat, um, but you should rat the guy out if he's a serial killer. But that wasn't what I was saying. But I didn't get to finish the sentence. The sentence was people don't like to rat somebody out and find out because they're afraid they're wrong. You, you think your cousin's a creepy dude? You think he could be the guy that killed Rachel Moran? Kind of looks like him. He is a liar. He'd moved from L.A.? You think it could be him, but you're afraid you're going to turn that guy in. You're going to rat this guy out and it's going to turn out to, to, not to be him. And then you feel like a bum. That's what I was trying to say, but I, I got cut. So you see, it, it, I, it, so the, the, I, that's what happens. And then people got a misunderstanding of what I was saying. But I got more, more things out on that than usual. <laughs> oh, Lord. But... <laughs> They sound like auctioneers, and you know, I, I I I speak too fast anyway, and I just I keep forgetting I gotta slow down. But um, in those shows, I even have a tendency to speak faster than here, because I I'm you know you know you've got okay Pat you've got two minutes, two minutes to get something out, and a lot of times they start that with a question you don't even want to answer. <laughs> you know, You're like. Pat, what do you think about this? I don't know. No, Pat, how is the DNA going to be tested in the Brian Koberger case? I don't know. I'm not a DNA analyst. Why are you asking me that question? <laughs> what do you think the police are doing with the DNA? I don't know. I'm not a police department. I'm a profiler. You know, stop asking me questions. That have nothing to do with me. <laughs> and then you get stuck and you have to try to segue. You know, it's, uh, it's I look nervous. Where? What? I look nervous on Dan Abrams. Oh, hell no. No, Dan Abrams, that was one of the most comfortable interviews I've done in a really long time. I don't know where you got. I was nervous. I never get nervous. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, Lord. No. Uh, I, I, I can't remember the last time I was ever nervous on any of these shows. It's more a frustration thing where you're just trying to make sure that you can move quickly into what you want to say. Um, Oh, that's, that's it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. The last time I was nervous on a show, my goodness. I remember <laughs> you get, you get so used to doing it. Hey, by the way, you know why people wonder why they're like somebody come on like to the tonight show and they'd be drunk. And they say, why would they show up drunk to the tonight show? It's probably because after a while, the tonight show to them was like a, a sofa in their living room. They just really didn't care anymore. It felt so normal for them. It's not hard to have an audience in front of you. You know, I've, I've done shows where, I've, you know, Montel Williams and, and I forgot who I have forgotten all the people I've done, but you know, you go and you sit on the couch and there's a, there's a live audience. 
it just doesn't affect you after a while because it's just, it's just daily life. <laughs> it really is. It's daily life. So, but you do sometimes feel like you're, it's not nerves. It's like trying to make sure you can get out in the Rachel Moran case. I wanted to get that information out. This wasn't, I didn't do the show to be on television. I'm not, I don't do television anymore. And I refuse television. I wanted to do that one thing for the family. So I want to make sure I got the information out about the flyer. That was why I did it. But, and I didn't want to be hijacked and not get that information out. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, all right. So, oh, it all depends. Nancy Grace never, never got away with that with me. It was, it was pretty funny. She, had, I, I think she had a good amount of respect for me. I, you know, she, I, she'd stay stuff and I just go, okay, Nancy. <laughs> and I was surprised she kept me on the show. Um, uh, thank you. You know, I don't, it's, it's, I don't do a lot of stuff for families under most circumstances because I do not feel like um, that I can do something that's going to have any, real use like somebody comes to me and says pat can you look at this information and this is this massive case and they've had pathologists looking at it. other people have already looked at it can you help me i'm like probably not if the police have already made the determinations you already have big people on it i can't i don't have any power to change that so then i'll say no uh on a few cases i'll say i'll i, I will look at certain cases under certain circumstances in this particular instance you know, he, he just, he wanted, the family member wanted to talk to me just because he was confused about what was going on. And I talked to him for about an hour. And then he says, is there anything that can be done? I really want to get this information to the public. And I said, I can make you a profile. And I think a bullet point chart, which I think is the one thing I think helps in investigations and is rarely done. And so I was able to just put that together and then they, then they, they're, they're distributing that. So um, it's nice when you can help in a way, you know, is, is, is at least useful. Now, whether whether a tip will come in on that or a tip will come in completely outside of that or the DNA will finally match up, I have no idea. But at least it was something I felt that was actually useful. And so I'll do something if I think it's actually useful. <laughs> Otherwise, I say, you know, it's not much I can do. You know, uh, that one, it, that one's it's about it's an hour from my house. It's an hour. It's an hour north of me in, in Maryland. So um Never been to that place, but uh, <laughs> you may bash Dr. Phil all you want. <laughs> Did a show one time, never do it twice. That guy, huh? Yeah, that, that's not even worth doing. Yeah, he's a horrible creature. He's a horrible creature. Yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the worst one I've ever dealt with in, 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 in all of the. I'm trying, I don't know how many talks, how many people I've been on air with, but. Um, if I try to think of who is the nicest one, it was it was Montel Williams. He was always very nice. And I did a show more than once, so, um, but he was always very pleasant, very polite. Um, allowed the people allowed me to speak. Uh, very. Uh, he was always good. He was. Uh, that was probably one of the better people I've ever. I don't know what he's like in person, but in you know when I came up to do the show, he was he was very good. Um, so I'm trying to think of who else was. <laughs> Most of the time, you, you don't, you know, you don't spend much time with the host. You're in the green room and then you're brought in, you sit down, they ask you questions, you leave, you know, so. <laughs> uh, Greta, Greta would not have me on her show. She didn't like me. <laughs> so, I don't know what it was with Greta. She did not like me. Yeah, it, that did not go well with her. So, yeah, she never let me on once. Um Sally, Jesse, and uh, Sally. No, I never was. I never was on Oprah. I was on Oprah's girlfriend's radio, sh her show. <laughs> um, but I wasn't. I was never on Oprah. So I, I, I don't. I don't like doing most of those talk shows. It's not really my thing. Um, I can't remember some of the. I've forgotten. I, sometimes I, you know, I look back. Uh, somebody says, "Oh, I remember seeing you on such and such a show," and I'm like, "Oh, was I on that show?" <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. I uh, was on Ricky. Yes, I was on Ricky for, I did my book, uh, How to Save Your Daughter's Life on her show. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, I did do her show. So, yeah. It, it, yeah, it all depends. It's just, it all depends who calls you up. They Most of the time, the TV people just, you know, the producers just use you. You know, they, 
we need somebody on our show. They call you up, put you on the show. They don't pay you. And, you know, that's the way it works in that industry. It's lovely. <laughs> I saw you all over. Yeah, I used to be all over everywhere. <laughs> but And I, I did get paid, as I pointed out before. You know, the, the TV, TV people never pay you, but I charged them. I, I, I developed a, 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 a car service I called Always Available Transport Service. And I said, I'm not using your limo. You'll have to pay pay for this. Pay this. I only use this service. And then I just drove myself in and they paid me $80 an hour from the time I left my house to the time I got back. So for all those years, I was one of the few people, one of the few commentators on the show that actually got any money. Most people work and don't get paid a penny. They just send them a limo, bring them in, pay them nothing, drive them home and drop them off. But I got paid for all those years. And that's the only reason I did it, because I said, I have to eat. I can't do 30 hours a week with you guys. You know, I can't work every day of the week and sometimes seven, even sometimes 40 hours, 50 hours. And I'm like, you're not going to pay me a penny. You're out of your damn mind. So I came up with this idea and they never figured it out. So I even had Canada AM paying for it, Today Show pay for it, CBS paid for it, Nancy Grace, all the HLN shows, MSNBC. <laughs> None of them figured it out. They thought they were hiring a car service. But I never said car, I said transport service. And I transported my butt right there and I transported my butt back. <laughs> so it worked out great. Oh, Lord. <laughs> no. But then they went to... They got rid of limos and they mostly went to um, uh, Zoom. So now I have a problem. You don't get paid for paid anymore. I can't. Well, nobody ever got paid, but I couldn't use the car service to get paid anymore because they were doing Zoom. So that was the end of that. So but, uh, is there still footage of those? Yeah, they're on this channel. Uh, uh, when I, I have another channel called Profiler Pat Brown. And when... Let's see what happened. Google took over YouTube. And when Google took over YouTube, they did something with uh, how you got into the account. And I could never get back into my account. And so my whole show, what I used to have, like, when I started this channel, I already had like 2,000 people over there, 3,000 people. And I couldn't get back into my own account. So I was just going to keep that account. And I had to, it's still there. You can go to it, Profile of Pat Brown. Uh, but what we did was we, I had somebody help me moved a good most of those videos. The old videos off of that channel are moved to this channel. They're the oldest ones on this channel because we just moved them all over as much as possible. So you can see some of the, uh, yeah, you can see some of those. Uh, I don't have obviously all of the stuff I ever did. I have tons of that in storage, but nobody cares, including me. And, but uh, I have enough to look back and say, oh boy, did I look younger. <laughs> Damn, I look good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, I don't, it's not on the playlist. Um, you no, know, it's not on the playlist. You just have to go to the oldest, oldest videos. You'll find them. And just, you know, that's where they are. If you go to oldest, you'll find them. Um, but it's not on one of the playlists. Uh, I guess I should make more playlists. I haven't got around to that. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Got an eat and stealing is an option. Well, I tried not to steal, you know, but you can't work for nothing. And the and the, I just said I just got a call two days ago. From, they wanted me to do documentary work, and I said, "What are you paying?" And they said, "We don't pay." And I said, "I don't play." Yeah, you make money. You're gonna sell the, the documentary is gonna go out on the networks. You're gonna make all that money. The producer gets paid. The host gets paid. Everybody gets paid except people are actually the talent in front of the camera. They don't get anything. So unless you're the host of the show, a lot of times you don't get paid. And uh, I have done some documentaries where I've done like different, you know, talked about different serial killers and stuff. And even those, the last one I did, I, I had to fight to get paid. I mean, I, I, they, they gave, they, we agreed on the payment, signed a contract, but they don't honor contracts. So I got half up front and then it took me six months to get the other half. And um, I only got that because they wanted me for something else. They finally said they had to pay me. I will never work again unless they pay me up front. Don't trust them. CNN still owes me 2000 bucks. They robbed me. So you can't pay, you can't fight them in court. It's just it's too hard. They got lawyers. I don't. <laughs> the, the, the TV industry is not 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 a, uh, an ethical place. I mean, there's ethical. There are great people in the industry. But as an industry goes, they're cutthroat. Um, yep. Isn't that something? Yep. They don't pay. Nope. 
you, when you look at Nancy Grace, Nancy Grace got paid a, a lot of money. And all those regulars you saw, including me, didn't get a penny. Yeah, except that I got am I 80 bucks an hour for driving myself in and driving myself home. So all those people you see on all these shows, they don't get paid a penny. And now that's true for YouTube as well. So like even for like that's uh, surviving the survivors show, for example, which people really like, or some of the new, some of the uh, news nation, I, I forgot they have panels and stuff. Nobody gets paid except the host. That's who's making the money. The rest of people work for free. It should be illegal, but it's not because you're getting free advertising, you know, <laughs> Really? That's interesting. But if you want to put in, if you just go to Profiler Pat Brown channel, you'll find all the video, the old videos are all there. You don't even have to, that's just a channel. I have a whole, that's a whole channel of my old stuff from back in the TV days. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> that's weird. It's weird to go back and look and say, wow, okay. But some of those, I started TV in 2000, 2000, wow, Chandra Levy. Uh, it was one of the first ones I did, I think, somewhere in 2000. It was after 9-11, I think. It was 9-11. <laughs> uh, I think I started around 2001, 2002. Somewhere in 2002, I think I started. And I quit television somewhere after about 15 years, 15 years into it. I quit for a number of reasons. One is I didn't like the way they treated the people on the shows, Um I didn't like the agendas. I didn't like the nasty panels. I didn't like not getting paid anymore. And my parents both were ill. So I mean, elderly and going downhill. So all of that came together. I said, I'm walking. So I did. And I never went back. So, uh, but except for a few documentaries, I'll do a documentary here and there, but now I'm going to do it only to pay me up front because I don't trust them for that either. 2000, 2003, is that when I started? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's they, that, that's it. They, um, they pay the host. If I had got my own TV show, show, I was I was up for like, oh my God, I don't know, 20, 20 different TV shows that they pitched and pitched and pitched, all kinds of things. And I almost got one with Court TV. It was called Rewind with Pat Brown. Um, and it got all the way to the top executive level. We had the whole sizzle tape, sizzle reel and everything. And somebody up there decided no. And that was the end of that. So I lost that show. And if I'd gotten that, then I might've gotten a really decent paycheck, <laughs> you know, but that's the way TV works. And it's, it's, it's one of the, it's like, it's like going to Hollywood and trying to become a star, you know, only a few people make it and other people do well, but they're not, you know, but TV, well, t they used to pay, they used to pay commentators like me. If, if I had come in like five years earlier, or 10 years earlier, I would have gotten paid very nice wages. They would have paid me every time I showed up. That was what they always did. And then somewhere about a, two, a year or two before I became a, a regular, they killed all the payments for all the commentators, except for if you have a, a four-star general, that guy gets paid, but nobody else. So, yeah, it's a crazy world. So, <laughs> oh, Lord. So anyway, um, yeah, and it's a funny world. But thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, I have... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, they're getting me from both sides, you know. Uh, I really do wonder how if they're any good or if they just taste like crap but look pretty. No, because it depends how well you make it. <laughs> but the mush, I like mushrooms, and I'm, but <laughs> I don't like death caps in my my beef Wellington. I can tell you that. So anyway, yeah, it's a crazy world. That is true. So anyway, uh, well, thank you for being here for everybody who's still in the chat room. We were just chatting away for reasons unknown. Um, and if you're still here and, and aren't a regular uh, that's coming in later, and when you're one of the public pe coming in later and you're not in the chat room and you're still here at this end, wow, you really hang in. <laughs> so sometimes once we talk about the whole case, we just get off on these little, little fun stuff. So anyway, y'all. I like having you all here, so it makes me happy. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to see you. Uh, I'm gonna, I've got a bunch of things people have asked me to do, and now that I have the internet back, that really ruined me for a while because I couldn't 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 do anything. Um, but I've got a few different things people have asked me to do something on, so I'll probably have a, maybe a video or two that have come up before the uh, hangout this week, which will probably still be on Thursday. That seems to be my best day for for hangouts. So, and this will be. 
Hmm. Oh, this will be seven o'clock on Thursday. Uh, yeah. So every other week is three o'clock and every other week is seven o'clock. So, and so people from the UK can be there for the three o'clock and then other people can be there for seven o'clock. And if you're out Australia, New Zealand way, you're all screwed. And you have to wait for me to do one of these shows at eight o'clock at night. <laughs> oh Lord. So anyway, oh my goodness. Um, hit the like button. Yeah. It's always nice if hit the like button, but um, still, I say, luckily things are still going in the right direction to keep me going. So thank God for that. So anyway, good night, everybody. I'm glad you were here. What time is it? Oh goodness. I did run over it. It's 10, almost 10, 10 20 here. Whew. Okay. Well, sorry about the few picture items, which you always know I screw up every time I do this. I don't know what it is. They sometimes just don't come. It's something to do with the transmission between uh, one drive and the, and the computer. It's very, very annoying and I can't seem to fix it. So <sighs> anyway, that's, that. that's my excuse. And <laughs> it's the same one as I always have. <laughs> anyway, see you next time. Bye.